sounds good. Okay. Um, welcome to this um, meeting of the City of Montpelier's Development Review Board. It is seven o'clock on Monday, May 18th, and we are getting underway with our first Zoom experience. Um, I am going to introduce our board members, and the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to go through the list of who our members are who are present, and um, I'll have each person raise his hand uh, so you can see who they are. Um, so here tonight are myself, Kate McCarthy. I am the chair of the DRB. We also have with us uh, Vice Chair Kevin O'Connell. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, RJ Adler. Roger Cran. Um, Rob Goodwin. Joe Kiernan. Jean Leon. Hi, Jean. Um, and then we are assisted tonight by our two fearless planning department staff, Meredith Crandall, our zoning administrator. Hi, sorry, Meredith, hi. conference room. They haven't switched my camera around so you can see me. That's okay. Just look for the look for the table. That's Meredith's Meredith's video feed. And then um, planning director Michael Miller. Okay. So what we're going to do next is I'm going to turn it over to Meredith and she's going to provide an overview of our remote procedures and processes because this is new for many of us. That will also be your chance to ask questions and um, let her know how things are going thus far. So with that, I will turn it over to Meredith. Thank you, Kate. Um, and just a procedural note, I think we may have lost Roger. Um, so he may be having difficulties with the internet connection tonight. Um, so um, this is, I'm gonna do a share screen here so that this is really more for people who are attending um, via ORCA and viewing the meeting. Um, but I wanna make sure that if anybody is out there just viewing it through, through ORCA, they know how to sign in and then a review of how to, um, how to take part in the conversation once you're in. So give me one second. Okay. Um, so due to the state of emergency declared by Governor Scott as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the Development Review Board is authorized to meet electronically. Um, so there's no physical location to observe um, contemporaneously with this meeting, but um, due to, in accordance with temporary amendments to the open meeting law, the Development Review Board is providing public access to the meeting via video conference through the Zoom meeting platform, um, including both video and telephone access options. You can also access the meeting through a live streaming of the meeting. All members of the Development Review Board have the ability to communicate at the same time during this meeting through the Zoom platform and the public has access to listen and if desired participate in this meeting in real time. If you are on ORCA and are not on the Zoom meeting and you wish to be, there's a link right here. You can cop, you know, write this into your browser. You can also view it on the City of Montpelier Planning and Community Development website. If you go to the Pending Applications page, there is a link right there. It's this link. Um, you can also call into the meeting um, using this phone number, 929-205-6099. Plug in the meeting ID and the password, and you'll be able to participate in the meeting. If you do just the phone call in, you won't be able to see anything that people are watching um, other than through the um, ORCA, but you, you, you'll be able to participate if you have questions. We previously gave notice to the public on how to access this meeting on our posted meeting agenda that was posted around the city as well as on the city's website at this link right here. If anybody has a problem accessing the meeting, please email the meeting moderator, Mike Miller at mmiller at montpelier-vt.org. If you're on the Zoom meeting and you're having difficulties accessing either the video conferencing feature or somehow your, your audio is muted and you can't unmute it, um, you can message Mike through the chat function in Zoom. Um, Mike is listed as the uh, Montpelier 
city council chambers. Um, so when you're participating in the meeting and have logged in through, through Zoom or called in through Zoom, you can tell the moderator which applications you wish to comment on. When the chair announces that the time for public comment for a particular application arrives, the moderator will unmute members of the public based on the order you've submitted your intent to speak, or the chair will call on you specifically. Um, if you're interested in speaking and you did not say that you would like to speak previously, please raise your hand if you're on video or state your name if you're unmuted and the city staff can add you to the queue. You can also um, use the chat function to reach out to Mike Miller and he'll let us know that you want to talk. There'll also be an opportunity at the end of every comment, public comment section where we unmute everybody to make sure we have caught everyone that needs to talk. Um, once the chair has recognized you to participate, um, you'll be unmuted to confirm that you can be heard and then you're free to provide your questions or comments aiming to keep those initial comments to two minutes. Board members will then have an opportunity to respond to your comments or ask questions of you, and the applicant may also have an opportunity to respond. The chair can grant additional time for speakers who have follow-up questions or comments. Um, and then after you find, you've finished all of your comments, your microphone will be muted again. The chair will then move on to the next person to speak. You can provide additional input later, but only after the chair recognizes you again. If we have start having problems with the public being able to access this meeting, it will be continued to a time and place certain. And then finally, please note that all votes taken during this meeting will be done by a roll call vote, um, put in, you know, called by the chair. I'll now hand the meeting back over to Kate. Oh, hold on, hold on, you're muted. Beginner, rookie, rookie error, rookie error. Um, that was a demonstration of the requirement to unmute yourself in order to be heard by the other participants. Um, and what I was saying was, uh, we're all learning and we're all going to do our best. Please bear with us. Please let us know if you have any questions and thank you in advance for your patience. All right. So Kate, the next I just item gotta... on... Hi, Kate. I just have to step in real quick. We have somebody on the phone and I can't chat with them. So I just wanted to find out who just called in on the phone. Hey, this is Michael. Hi, Michael. Great. Can, so that's uh, Michael is our tech. Yes. Sorry, I'm having a heck of a time logging in. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Thanks for making it by phone. We will uh, we'll invite your participation that way until the point where we may get you your face to join us as well. But thanks for being here. Okay. Okay. So um, what we're going to do next is the approval of the agenda and I will do a roll call vote um, to have the agenda approved. And please do remember to unmute yourself. This will be our little our practice item. Um, are there first, are there any um, modifications to the agenda as printed? Uh, Kevin, you have your hand raised. Please go ahead. And please unmute yourself. Mm. Kevin? For some reason, I can't seem to unmute him. Something's going. OK. Kevin, we can't hear you. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. OK, you just got to gotta click it until it works, I guess. OK, so here's my, here's my question, and having to do not with the content of the agenda, but for clarification of items number six and number seven, the two action items we have this evening. Uh, what is the intended uh, outcome for, th for these two items? Are we doing preliminary review? Are we doing final review? What exactly are we, are we uh, 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 planning to do tonight? Um, do you want me to speak to that, Go ahead, Meredith. Okay. Yes, please. Um, so both of these items are full review. There's no preliminary stage to it, unless for some reason um, the board feels that there are unanswerable questions or unanswered questions that need more information, in which case the meeting will be continued on that particular item. Okay, so so just, just to be clear, the new ordinance basically says once it's on the agenda, it goes as far as the as the uh, procedural review, as the review uh, can take it, 
And it's not, it's not like preliminary review uh, and final review. We just do what we can with the information that we have. And if it's not complete, we continue it. Correct. The only okay. thing now with split reviews um, would be subdivisions and I think planned unit developments. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Kevin. That's a good question. And one that I had asked Meredith earlier myself. Um, do other board members have uh, questions or modifications to the agenda? Uh, okay, I have just one small modification, which is to note under item seven that we're not reviewing um, a food bank as a use, we're reviewing a bank <laughs> as a use, just for, just for the record. Thank you, Kate. Right. No, I missed that. No, no problem. You must have been hungry. Um, well, I think so it would be square, square foot. An understandable error. <laughs> All right, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? with the oh, modification move. suggested. I, Motion by Kevin. Second. Second. Second by RJ. All right, I'm going to go through and say your name. You can say yes or no. So to vote, RJ. Yes, yes. Yeah. Roger. I don't think he came back in. I think we lost Roger. Okay, okay. Um, Rob. Yes. Joe. Yes. Michael. Yes. Jean. Yes. Kevin. Yes. And I, Kate, also vote yes. Thank you. We have approved the agenda. Um, comments from the chair. I've mentioned that this is our first remote meeting, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be doing it with all of you. It uh, I will. I, I, I expect great things, and thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to welcome our new development review board members who are jumping right in. Um, RJ Adler, Joe Kiernan, and Jean Leon are all here with us for their first official hearing tonight. So um, welcome, looking forward to meeting many of you in person at some point soon, I hope, um, but appreciate your being here tonight. So um, with that, we're going to move into our first application, which is item six on the agenda for four College Street. This is a review for an addition. Um, it is before us because it is taking place on steep slope. And um, first what I'm gonna do is just let you know how we take testimony on something like this. So um, you'll hear an overview of the application from the staff and then the applicant will have a chance to talk a little bit about their project. Um, DRB members can then ask questions. Then there will be the opportunity for other witnesses who would like to be heard on a matter to present their cases or ask questions. Um, and then DRB quest, uh, members can ask questions um, of those witnesses. We can have rebuttals if necessary. And then there will be a discussion of the application uh, and deliberations and um, if, if possible, a vote. And that's the same process that we will be following for the 105 State Street application today. So um, I'll say that again, but just wanted to let everyone know kind of the path that we will be traveling. Um, I assume that people can hear me all right. Otherwise I would have been told otherwise by now. Um, you can nod I, or shake your head. I think Liz has, Liz Dodd has a question. So, okay. I, here we go. When uh, would there be an sure. opportunity for public questions? Thank you, that's a good question. Um, if it's a public question about a specific application, what we'll do is open College it up Street. after, yes. Okay, we'll open it up to public for questions after the applicant has presented their project and after development review board members have had a, had a, um, a chance to ask some questions. Okay. And could, because sometimes that back and forth will answer questions that neighbors have, but then we'll open it up. Okay, thank you. Before the vote. You're welcome. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Great. So um, the next thing I'll do is I'll swear in anyone who may wish to be heard on the application. And that, that could be um, a neighbor or any, anyone else who just thinks they may wish to comment. So if that is you or you're the applicant, what I'll have you please do is raise your right hand. And I'll administer the oath, okay? Um, first, I will just swear in folks for the four College Street um, application that we're about to hear. <laughs> um, so do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do, I do. All right. Thank you, you have been sworn in. 
All right, so Meredith, could you please tell us a little about this application? Yes, um, so the Four College Street application, the applicant is seeking approval to build a 730 square foot addition um, of a ground floor master suite on the rear of the existing single family home, as well as a carport over and a fence around an existing parking area. The building site includes slopes of greater than or equal to 30% and therefore requires approval by the Development Review Board. This is the only reason this is coming before the DRB. Um, there are three really outstanding issues highlighted in the staff report. Um, first, does the project meet the steep slopes requirement of section 3007? So this starts on page four of the staff report and I'll, I'll pull up a share screen after I've done the overview. Um, there don't appear to be any structural or slope integrity issues, but there are some outstanding questions regarding stormwater management and the board will need to make an official determination regarding the compliance with each of the steep slopes criteria. So that's big issue number one. Um, second, there's some stormwater issues. These are also discussed um, with regard to steep slopes, but you have to make a determination under section 3009 of the regulations regarding stormwater compliance as well. And then finally, um, I've highlighted some issues that remain regarding whether the pro proposed fence around the carport complies with the requirements of section 3101. Um, I believe we have Liz Dodd to speak on this when we get to that point. Um, I do know that there was another neighbor who had expressed an interest up and she has signed on. So Christine Zakai is on as well when we get to that point. All right, I'll hand it back over to you, Kate, unless you have any questions. I do not, so um, thank you for that overview. So what I'll do now is I'll invite the applicants um, to unmute themselves and um, speak a little bit to the project, anything that they would like to add or any specifics um, that, are, that they'd like to highlight. And that, and, um, that could be the applicant or the applicant's um, an engineer or a designer or anything else like that. Sure. So. Thank you, Kate. So my name is Dan Clare from Clare Construction. Um, elsewhere here, uh, co-presenting with me here is McCall. He is our design, our designer, and uh, Peter and Therese uh, Kelman Mejo are are also here as the as the owners. But I'll I'll provide the overview, and that this is. Um, this is a uh, addition being built kind of behind the existing home. Um, the existing home has um, its bedrooms up on the second level and uh, we have designed a addition that goes off the rear of the home to provide kind of, um, kind of an aging in place addition, um, you know, allowing the owners to stay put in their home. And, um, and um, yeah, we've, We've got some, uh, you know. I guess we'll wait until we get to the to the to the red highlights as far as the as far as the drainage. But um, you know, kind of kind of got some kind of some thoughts there. We can reply to when the time comes. But um, yeah, are there any any specific questions that I can that I can answer for anybody? I think yeah. I think what we might do is. Oh um, yeah, go ahead, Meredith. I was just saying, Dan, if you want, you should have the ability to share your screen if you want to pull anything up, or I can pull up the application on my screen and share it okay. at any point that you need that. Okay, very good. Um, great. Um, would, would, would Peter Kalman and Therese McGow, McGow like to add anything? Go ahead and unmute if you do. No, uh, Dan, Dan gave the gave it the overview. We can at, we can all answer questions later. Okay, great. Um, Kevin has a question. Go ahead. Uh, what is the what is the existing slope condition? What is the, how steep is it? Um, Mikhail, can you can you speak to those specific numbers? Um, yeah, if we look at um, in the application um, sheet, uh, it's from uh, Grenier surveying, Grenier engineering, um, the slope analysis report uh, based on the LIDAR of the site. Um, the site is anywhere um, up to 
uh, up to 30%. So we're, we're just in the area, um, I'm looking at the, the color coding here and seeing what it is. Yeah, we're just, just barely touching into some 30% right underneath that corner of the foundation, right? Um, on the Northwest corner, yep, right there. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, I'm adjusting my screen so that I can see more of the participants here because when we do share a screen, I can't see who's raising their hand. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. I'm going to figure that out. Um, who's that with a question? Uh, Joe. Go ahead, Joe. On that plan that you had up there when you were sharing the screen, it shows the carport has the similar 30% slopes. Um, but there's an existing retaining wall there already, according to the plans. Correct. So I guess I'm wondering, is there a 30% slope across the, the floor of the carport? Uh, no, this is based off of a LIDAR plan. Um, um, and the, the retaining wall in the driveway was, um, was leveled a few years back. Okay. Um, and that was another this, question in mind because I went on Google Earth. I didn't see the car park, but it was an eight-year-old photograph. So I was wondering if that retaining wall had been built recently. Yeah, the retaining wall, um, I believe it was two or three years ago. Peter and, and Therese will, will know the time frame on that. Okay. It is an existing structure. Good. Thank you for that question. All right, so I think what, um, if there are no other general questions from, I, I would take additional general questions from DRB members at this point. Uh, Rob, yes. Yeah, um, I just have one more question just to kind of follow up there. Um, uh, could you just kind of run through the process? So, or maybe clarify, like all of the slope analysis came from LIDAR. Um, I guess I think I saw a note on maybe another sheet, maybe it was an older sheet that it was a composite of uh, the Grenier survey and the LIDAR. So I don't know if you could sort of go through the sourcing of where the slopes are coming from, if it's all LIDAR or if it's not. It, um, it is all LIDAR pro provided by Grenier. Okay. Uh, Grenier you. was on site and they um, they surveyed the, the boundaries um, oh. and the LIDAR. They provided the LIDAR as well. Okay, thank you. All right, other questions from DRB members at this point? Okay, it appears not. Um, so what I would like to do is kind of move, move through the staff report and talk through some of the standards. Um, actually, I'm thinking that through. Perhaps at this point, I would like to um, hear from anyone else who wishes to speak on the project who isn't an applicant or a D DRB member. So, um, um, Lizbeth Dodd, would you would you like to speak at this point? Thank you very much for recognizing me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I'm sitting outside of my deck that totally overlooks Peter's house just by way of orientation. And to my right is Christine, who's another participant here and a number of questions I'm gonna to defer to her. But between the two of us, we can perhaps provide some anecdotal background information and just wanted to share with you. Um, first on stormwater, and I've been a homeowner here in this home for about 10 years. And we can look at graphs and do I have a question? I'll try to make this brief. No, but just some background that uh, speaking with neighbors who are uphill from me, and in my own home, the bulwarks that have, were put in place when this building was built back in the, I think my house was built back in the early 1960s. And so it was because of um, stormwater that ran off down this hill. It goes off through backyards and down the hill. And from um, my, another neighbor, um, the next two neighbors up the hill. Um, so there is water and there is runoff, which, um, has forces that necessitated building bulwarks in our basements. So again, we can look at graphs and then we can look at what's in place. 
Um, so I am concerned about runoff, particularly as we look at climate change and what's going to be happening and potential increase in changes over the next five to 20, 25 years on our slope here. And I think uh, the homes down below us are going to be experiencing this as water runs off to the uh, river below. So I really want us to be cognizant of this um, and what's going to be happening with the forces in my basement and in my home and also with Peter's home and people down below. So, um, um, so that's it on stormwater, that it is there and it does happen. And while it might not look like only one corner on a garage, it is forces that go across you know, the basements of all our homes. Thank you. Christine? Thank you. And um, yep, I, I understand that Christine is another um, neighbor wishing to speak on this application. So I'd invite Christine to unmute and, uh, and chime in. Hi, thanks, Kate. Thanks, Liz. Good to see you. Um, and we chose not to submit um, comments on the project. I think Liz's point about stormwater is a really valid one. Um, and I understand that Grenier did a really thorough soil analysis, but my first reaction about this project was really deep concern about um, the potential for unstable slopes and unstable soil, um, given that you know we live on the same soils, on the same slopes, and um, just having personal experience from um, uh, you know, having the slopes move really clearly over time, just in the six years that we've lived in this house, um, and in the past, this house has required um, um, uh, work to be done on the foundation because of, of the, the slopes moving. Um, you know, that being said, I'm not an engineer, and, um, you know, I understand that Grenier has been involved in the project, which is great, but that, you know, on the face of it is something that, um, uh, you know, initially caused concern for me. Okay. Well, thank you. I think um, what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the features of the application as we go through the staff report and receive testimony on how it um, purports to meet the different standards that, that, that it's required to meet. So um, we'll take, take that into account as we do that. So um, as the next step, that's what I'd like to do is, is look at the, if there are no other questions from DRB members and no other um, members of the public wishing to comment. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll um, start looking at the staff report. Um, I believe the applicants have a copy of that and DRB members do as well. I'm, I'm looking down because I have it written in, I have it in front of me. Um, so we're just going to go through it um, and show how this project adheres to our standards. So starting on page three, once we get past the permit history with the general standards, um, we've confirmed here that this will continue to be a one or two dwelling unit house. This is my understanding. That won't change. That's cool. um, and so it meets the use, use standards of our zoning. Um, so then we look um, at how the project adheres to the dimensional standards, um, footprint, height, setback, um, the size of the lots not changing. And um, we are, we learned from the application that the lot coverage is within range of what it is supposed to be, um, that the proposed changes will not exceed the requirements um, or encroach upon the setback. So we have um, evidence shows that it, it meets those requirements. Okay. Um, I, I want to I want to go quickly without rushing. So that's that's the line I'm going to try and walk here. Um, we don't need there are no riparian areas, wetlands, or vernal pools. Nothing is being demolished, so we don't need to meet any requirements related to those. Um, so then at the bottom of page four of the staff report, um, we're going to look at the provisions having to do with steep slopes, which as Meredith pointed out is the main reason, the only reason that this addition is before our board. Um, so what we're going to do is go, go through 
our just the standards, uh, the, the results from the Department of Public Works and then the standards for the steep slope construction. Um, so as you can see in the staff report on page five now, the DPW did not raise concerns um, about the engineered designs or the slope specific matters. Um, and we'll get to the stormwater issues in a couple of minutes. But um, what I'd like to do is go through the different criteria for the slopes and um, DRB members, if you have any, if, if anything you wanna add or applicants, we will, I'll take your testimony on those. So the project must limit the amount of disturbance clearing and existing, and <laughs> limit the amount of disturbance, the cl clearing of existing natural vegetation and impervious surface in order to minimize the potential for erosion, stormwater runoff and flooding and water quality impairment. Um, do DRB members have any comments or questions about that for the applicant? Staff, staff finds that that standard is met. Um, similarly, the next standard not to create slopes of over 30% is also met. I'm going to look as best as I can for raised hands, but if I miss it because I'm looking at, a, at an iPad here, um, do chime in. And at this point, um, I'm mostly going to take comments from applicant and DRB members, but I do see um, Lizbeth, please, please go ahead. I'm sorry. Um... So this has to do, it's tied into um, agricultural use. And that's another topic to um, perhaps come up is the use of the um, land that's next door to this site. And there's been in talking with um, the applicant on the use for this site, it may potentially be somewhat uh, changed. And so I'm wondering what if any implications that may have for stormwater and, and runoff, um, any agricultural runoff that may happen um, now or in the future should someone else come in. Um, so, uh, okay, that's kind of it. That, um, also to watch the water that goes down College Street here, like the other night when we had the stormwater warning is just incredible. All right, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, thank you. I think we're going to probably discuss that in the context of stormwater generally, since it'll have to do with um, movement of, of sediment and anything else off the parcel. Um, Meredith, do you have anything to add on that issue in particular? Um, I, I would just say as a reminder that the DRB needs to review the application as the application, the, the um, Applicants and owners at this point aren't applying to change any use on the property. And if they were going to, you know, that, that would be a whole separate application process. Um, I think that's all they've got right now. And we'll, we'll deal with stormwater questions, like you said, when we get there. Okay, thank you, Meredith. Um, the next standard is a requirement to preserve distinctive natural features, the general topography of the site and existing veg natural vegetation. And it appears that that is happening, <laughs> given that no extra, no trees are being removed or woody vegetation. Um, do DRB members or the applicants wish to comment on how that standard is met or not? That that is true. We will not be removing anything. You know, any there will be no trees being removed. Thank you. Um, so next we move into the standard um, pertaining to stormwater. Um, maintain or reduce the pre-existing rate and retain the pattern of stormwater runoff leaving a property. So we know that this is the addition of some impervious surface that is not there before, though the coverage is still less than the required, the, the maximum. Um, so the comment from the Department of Public Works is that there does need to be additional review of the footing drain discharge um, to understand impacts to the downhill property. And it may require, there may need to be an infiltration basin or direct connection to the municipal storm drain. And it's also not clear, at least from the materials submitted thus far, how the new roof rainfall runoff, let's say that three times fast, um, will be managed. So I would like to hear a little bit more about that, both sure. of those issues. 
Um, so can I can I work backwards there um, and and I'll sure. address the the new roof rainfall runoff first. Um, and you know the the uphill side of the of the home of the new of the new part of the home um, and frankly the existing part as well. But the the uphill side has a swale built into it. Um, is that Meredith? Is that your screen there that we're looking at? Um, so now I wish I had a actually. Um, yeah, so Meredith, is if you can leave that screen right there for a second. Yep, or feel um, free to share yours if you would prefer no, to be able to control that's it. That's okay. I think I can uh, I think I can just do this. Um, you know, there there is there are some there is some existing swale, there's some drawn in swales that are that are represented, you know, right around where I'm drawing those green lines. Um, and so the mm -hmm. you know the, the contour of the land um, will be, you know, the the, the roof will shed its water, you know, this way, and any downhill, any water running downhill will run this way, and there will be a swale um, that kind of brings the water um, around and down uh, downhill. So I know that I think that if in the staff report it said that, uh, um, you know, addition, and it says if not, the additional detail is needed for a swale up gradient of the proposed structure. And, and in fact, there is already a, um, a, a swale detail proposed on the uphill side of the proposed structure. Okay. Thank you. And are, as far as the, any runoff that would come on the downhill side, how is that proposed to be handled? So the downhill side, um, you know, there will be, you know, it's just gonna continue to, to run downhill, um, not, not unlike it does not you know not too dissimilar to, to what it to what it does presently the the way the site is presently naturally great or the presently the contours of the property most of the water is going towards the corner where the footing drain is exiting and i believe the, the current footing drain is in that area as well mm -hmm. um and that's that's where a lot of the water is going to in a natural state now to, so just to bring people up to up to speed, um, the the proposed footing drain is is here. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm got the couple of clumsy green circles there, but that line right there, um, right from the corner of the house down to there, that is the proposed uh, discharge for the for the footing drains. Okay, and for. For my own benefit and for the assurance of the other folks on the call, could, could you just tell us real quick what a footing drain is and where the water goes after it's in the drain? Sure, thank you. So um, at the bottom of a foundation, um, you know, underneath the kind of the wall is the footing. Um, and that's, you know, X number of feet down as, as suggested by the structural drawings elsewhere in this document. And uh, right at the footing level is a perforated pipe. And so, you know, we kind of backfill up against the foundation with a, with a you know, a crushed stone type of material and the water, um, you know, any water that comes off the roof, um, some of it will kind of sheet off down the, down the hill and some of it will kind of go down into the drainage stone and into the footing drain. Um, and it kind of keeps, keeps the water away from the building, keeping, keeping the building, keeping the building dry. Great, thank you. Um, do DRB members have any questions about about this? Just to be clear, because I, I was a little confused by that last that last comment, the footing drain is on the uphill side. It's all around the. It's around the entire, entire structure. The yes. Proposed structure. So That's this correct. this is the this is the new addition we're talking about. What is the how is the stormwater handled from the existing structure? There is an existing. Um, drain system um, up that's on the uphill side of the existing structure. And that, okay. that, that will, that will, you know, that will be disrupted. The discharge of that will be disrupted by the proposed structure, but, you know, only temporarily, and it will get tied into the new drainage um, system and discharged in that lower corner of the lot. So that water currently from the current structure exits the property where exactly? From in its in its current state? Is that yes. your question? Yes. 
Uh huh. Um, I will get my little drawing tool here again. So there is a drainage pipe that goes along the along the uphill side of the building, and it discharges something something like that, Kevin. Mm -hmm. So so the 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 current structure and the proposed structure is is perforated pipe with. Uh, basically crushed granite or gravel or what have you as a as a uh... yeah well some combination of perforated pipe and solid pipe but right yeah. okay mm -hmm. um, and my my experience with that kind of system is that it works great in the beginning but that requires ongoing maintenance to keep it clear yeah so typical details would be to um, you know to provide a clean out access um, because indeed, sometimes these things do need to be cleaned out. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, is that Joe? Yep. Go ahead. Um, so that footing drain there would exit just as an open pipe? The proposed one in the lower corner of the lot? Yep. That's correct. Okay. As, it, as the engineer has drawn it, that is, that is correct. And would the uh, gutters from the new part of the structure be tied into that footing drain? We're not proposing gutters on the on the okay. proposed structure. No gutters. Uh, currently, the drain that you drew there that's gone now, is that also a single point that it exits out of? That's correct. OK. OK, thank you. So in Joe's raising the question about a single point of discharge. I think that is a good one. Um, or I think we're looking at a little more square footage of the roof on the addition than in the current. Uh, obviously, it's an addition. Um, would the volume and velocity of that discharge have a potential for erosion, or how does that work? Yeah. Um, do you want to? No, go ahead, Mikkel. Most most footing drains are are subsurface. And, and water, the little bit of water that, that happens to, to break the sod or get through the sod and, and down five, five and a half feet. So there's not a lot of storm water that reaches that level. Um, and, and most of the time, a footing drain has a trickle at best that comes out of it, um, even on a steep slope like this. Um, and, and talking to Don, um, after, you, after I read the concerns, talking to Don Marsh about it, he would be surprised if, if the footing drain um, had water coming out of, I think he said 60%, 70% of the time, um, most, you know, it would be dry that, that amount of time. Uh, what we're looking at is rainwater or stormwater runoff, um, and that would be slowed by the uphill swale system that we are creating naturally around the building. Uh, the existing building, sh it sheds to the front um, and then the addition, it would shed to the back and then slow, be slowed by the flattened, natural flattened area at the back of the corner of the property. Yes, I, I can report, that, um, I, I, this is a Peter Kalman, uh, the current uh, drain, single point drain that comes off the back side of the current house, I have never seen anything more than a trickle, even in the hardest rains, even when there's a river running down College Street. And we actually have, um, we feed into it from two places, one at the footing and one about halfway up where the clay level we have also has water running over. So it's, it just hasn't been a problem. And this is sort of the same idea. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that information and also um, the footing drain 101 that is that is useful to me for this and for the future. Um, any other que any questions from other DRB members about that particular standard to maintain or reduce the pre-existing rate and retain the pattern of stormwater runoff leaving, leaving the property? Yeah, Rob. Um, so as far as the grading goes, um, you have on the downhill side and the footing drain. What is out, coming out from the building? Um, will that be graded flat from the fat, you know, building wall out before the, the you know, slope slopes downhill again? 
Michelle, can you speak to that? Um, on the downhill side, it is it is a shallow slope, but there's there's nowhere on this property that it's flat. Um, this is a these are one foot contours, um, and I, it's it's about a one foot in three to three and a half foot slope. Um, if we go up to the um, uh, or go down to the grading, um, it's all in the yellow in that area. So it's a 15. We're not changing the slope um, or we're not intending to change um, the slope in the lower area. We're just tying it back up into the, up into the building um, where it's been interrupted. So the, so the slope at which the, the downhill drip edge is, that will be um, natural existing slope, right? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Any other questions on this from DRB members? All right, great. I'm going to move on through the other standards. Um, the project needs to produce a final grade that is compatible with the surrounding natural terrain. And I think um, this appears to be the case. Straight a harmonious transition between the graded slopes and the natural terrain. Hey, can you um, just again? Can you just, can you just help me out? What page are we on at this point? Sure, I'm on the staff report, page six, and I'm on the standard um, little five, little six, et cetera. Very good, thank you. Yep, certainly. Um, avoid creating continuous unbroken slopes or linear slopes. Um, this appears to be the case as well. Contouring graded slopes by varying slope increment to produce a final grade that undulates both vertically and horizontally. I think that is also accomplished. I've just run through a few in a row. Do DRB members have anything to add on those standards or the applicant? Okay, I'll continue. Um, very cut and fill banks and terraces to produce a final grade that has visual interest and allows for naturalistic landscaping. Um, again, the slope is remaining uh, largely unchanged around the addition. Consider the use of retaining walls and terracing rather than cut and fill. That appears to be what's happening. Vary the pad elevations on sites with multiple structures to follow the natural terrain. It appears to follow the natural terrain and we are just talking about one structure, not multiple structures. Um, no new roads or drives are created. Um, compact building forms and or multi-story buildings to minimize building footprint. And we do have that in the proposal. And then use split or multi-level building forms that step up or down the slope. Um, it's step down, it has a step down foundation to fit into the slope. Um, so those are the, the standards we need to conclude are met in order to approve this. Do the RB members or the applicant have anything else to add? Okay, um, so we have asked for clarification regarding stormwater management and um, we've discussed compliance with the steep slope design standards. So I'm just gonna march right through this staff report. It may, may seem a bit belabored, but I don't wanna miss anything. Um, we're on page seven now. Um, erosion control, um, We've received, we've received the plan and it seems to be found acceptable by DPW. Um, are there any questions from DRB members about that standard related to erosion? No, it seems to be meet what's required. Great, I agree. Um, regarding section 3009, stormwater management, um, we talked about the flows, we've talked a lot about the footing drains and how those flows are managed. Um, so let's, let's just talk a little bit. We, we've learned more about how the roof rainfall runoff will be managed. Um, could, could you just give us um, either, either Dan or, or the applicant um, or Mikhail a, a concluding statement about how this is going to avoid impacts on the downhill properties? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to, to echo to echo Mikkel's comments, um, you know, the footing drains um, 
you know, we'll, we'll, uh, you know, we were told by the engineer that there, you know, we don't, ex you know, the vast the majority of the time, he does not anticipate, um, you know, water to be, to be coming out of there. And in the, you know, the times that it does say that as per his estimate, the 30 or so percent of the time that it does discharge water, it's not expected to be um, a substantial amount. Um, and so we, you know, for, for the engineer, they don't anticipate, um, they don't anticipate, um, you know, erosion or you know uh, detrimental effects of that of the water coming out of that pipe okay thank you and would the applicant be open to a condition that the department of public works approve a revised stormwater management plan that reflects all of this sorry if, say if that one more time Pete. Um, would you be open would meredith can correct me if i've got this wrong but would the applicant be open to a condition to submit an up-to-date stormwater management plan that reflects everything we've discussed, if that's not already part of, of the material. Oh, gotcha. Basically, you know, am I, to, to put it in my own words, are you asking, like, you know, that the permit be granted in condition that the engineer kind of put in writing what we've just discussed? Um, I think the idea is, Meredith can help me out here. Um, are you envisioning a visual, Meredith, or a um, written stormwater management plan? Um, so, Dan, what I would be envisioning is something that's an updated visual stormwater yes. management plan, something that has actu the actual swale details, like you know, sometimes you'll pull that from the standard so it shows what the actual slope is, you get a cutaway view of the, of the swale, and that gets put in as well as where you would place, say, a clean out, because you were talking about having a clean out in here, yeah. have those details on um, the site plan or even just a, a separate stormwater management plan that gets submitted to um, DPW for approval and then it would come to me as zoning administrator before the permit was issued. Yes, of course, if that, that if that's if that's what feels prudent to the DRB, of course, we'll have, we're happy to happy to provide that. And, and that would just be a condition of the approval. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So, it, and then the final review, unless we deem it otherwise, would be uh, most likely DPW. Sure, we can we can certainly do that. Okay, great, thank you. And I saw some nods from other DRB members that that is a desirable condition. So thanks. Yes. Okay, so we've gotten through two of the three issues that Meredith highlighted as needing to be discussed. Those being um, meeting the slope standards and discussing stormwater standards. And next, we're going to move on to the special use standards. And the special use in question here is a, a the addition of a fence. Okay. Um, and fences, I'm gonna to turn to the fence section of my zoning. It is section 3101A of our zoning for anyone who's playing along at home. Great, okay. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about what's proposed specifically uh, in the fence department? Yeah, Mikhail, you wanna lead that one? Yeah, um, so what we're looking at is a, um, is a dual sided fence. So there's no back side of the fence. Um, uh, it is six foot three and a little bit. Um, it's, a, it's above the standard. The, the thought is it, it is partially for privacy and partially for um, um, snow um, coming into the carport. Uh, the first floor of the existing structure and the main level, um, not the entry level, but the main level of the addition um, at the foundation are 40, is 42 inches approximately above grade. By the time we're a foot away from the building, um, it's, it's almost four feet above grade. Um, we're, we're really close and that's my doing my best to, um, to, uh, uh, to estimate where the floor level is um, from the outside. Um, so it's it's really a you know if we have to if we have to take the three inches off of it we we can obviously but uh, the fence is really to provide a um, a, a windbreak for the parking uh, for the parking area and um, and some privacy as well. Okay, um, are there any DRB members who have questions about the um, the fence that's being proposed? Can you zoom? Can you zoom on it a little bit? 
Could we zoom into the image that's on the screen here? Correct. Yep. Uh, yeah, just a minute. Yeah, let's try that. Looks like that is being attempted. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I have a hard time zooming and then sliding the picture right and left for some reason on this laptop. Okay. It's not my laptop. Um, Meredith, uh, thank you. No, that's, that's I think, a good effort. That from our end, I'm sure. Uh, Mikhail, do you want to bring up your screen so we can zoom in on the fence? Yeah, let me see if I yeah. can do that here. Yeah. And Mikhail, while you do that, I'm going to ask Meredith, uh, I'm going to have Meredith elaborate on a piece of this. So the maximum height allowed for expenses is six feet tall, unless the ground floor elevation of the principal building is at least four feet higher than the elevation at the base of the fence or wall. So that's for, I, I'm having trouble translating that into a visual, Meredith. Could you help me understand what we're saying here? With this um, I, I will do my best considering we have never looked at this provision ever. This is the first time it's ever come up. Um, so I, I think I think Mikhail was trying to describe this earlier. It's just unfortunately I wasn't able to zoom in on the visual at the same time. So the base of the first floor, I know there's, so there's a little dotted line here. Oop. So, so this level right there, right here yes. where my cursor is, if you can see that right there, mm -hmm. that's the first, that's approximate first floor level. Mm -hmm. And from here to the grade at the, at the foundation, is just over mm -hmm. 42 inches. And by the time we're here, we're, we're at, about, uh, at about the four foot level. And so what you're comparing for this, this provision regarding fences, what you're comparing is where that first floor level is actually mm -hmm. to where the base of the fence is. And the base of the fence is, is right below, about- Is below four feet, yes. Is below four feet, especially over there on the far yep. side. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I thank you for that, Taurus. I could add something because I'm, I'm a little familiar with this because we put up a deer fence and when we went to put up the deer fence a couple of years ago, um, I spoke to um, uh, people at, in planning and zoning and they mentioned the six foot and um, the idea is they don't, we don't want zone, we don't want people building a wall around a house that looks like it's saying don't come near us and <laughs> That, that is not really the intent here. In fact, when Mikkel said for privacy, uh, that's the first I've heard about that. Our sole reason for wanting it is we're old. We're only gonna get older. We're, we don't wanna build a garage. We wanna have a carport, but we're gonna need in the winter to get out of the car and walk undercover to the front door. And if the, and if the wind comes in over our stone wall and blows in on that side, it's gonna be pretty hard to do that. So this is really just a storm fence. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the explanations and the visuals, and together those help um, help us understand the intent of that particular standard that none of us have tried before using before. Hey, so it's up hey, to the. Hey, it's up to. Yes. Hey, hey this is Michael Lazorchak. Go ahead. I've, I've lost a little bit of the the boil here. So are we saying that the fence? falls within that exception or doesn't? That's our, um, that's what we need to decide is whether okay. it falls within that exception. And I'm, hey, I'm hey, seeing have... evidence. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Oh, I'm seeing evidence that says it does fall within that, that suggests to me as one board member that it falls within that exemption. I'd be interested okay. to hear from others. Does, um, does Meredith have anything more to add? It sounded like she was mid thought, and then we got a little sidetracked with deer and snow fences. Oh no! I um thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. So now that we have the clarification from the applicants, so that we can figure out where those four foot lines are, um, you know, if I had had if I'd been able to get that clarification before, I probably would have said this four feet higher than elevation at the base of the fence or wall exemption is where we would go in to allow this taller than what we would normally allow fence. Okay. And we're talking about about four inches taller than what we would normally allow. So that's exactly. the, the scale and, of the exemption. Okay. 
Meredith, do you remember the the previous permit? And I know it's been months uh, where we, I believe, we denied the fence height. What what was the? And that was a matter of inches as well, if I remember correctly. Do you, like, do you have any memory on that one? Yeah. Yep, I do. So that was a front yard fence set uh, front side right. limit, which is much more restrictive than the side and the rear yard. Um, sure. the, the front yard fence doesn't have any of these explicit exemptions. We were limited to looking at the dimensional 10% exemption um, under the section 3002. Um, right. That, that was one reason that that, had to, that, that that was so much harder to allow. But do you remember the that actual, because wasn't it like two or three inches that they were over? Um, I, you, if you I don't think, remember, yeah, uh, I mean, it was, it was a matter yeah. of inches. It was a matter of inches, but here with the, with the exemption, part, they, it's a different, it's different altogether because front of the front of the house and then et cetera, et cetera, and it fits within an exemption in exactly. this instance that we get over the two to three inch difference. Yep, exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. That's a good question, Michael. We have different tools to consider the exemption depending on where the fence is located. Uh, question from Rob. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to point out, I think that uh, I mean, this may be like, logical as proposed, but in a way here, we're building a fence on top of a wall. Right. And I just think that maybe we should you know, address address what what's specific here. <laughs> I don't know if you would, you know, a retaining wall is different than maybe a wall is that is intended to as described in section 3101, but um it, the, at first glance it's a fence on top of a wall. That's the way I see it. <laughs> so I, I don't know if there's a any input on that. The, the, the wall is a retaining <laughs> is a retaining wall for the driveway, we expanded the driveway. When we bought the house, the driveway was un unsafe and narrow. We, we, we uh, expanded the driveway, the walls of a uh, retaining wall. This fence is actually located, you know, well in from the wall, four feet, I believe, in from the wall. Okay. Okay. Does that address your concern, Rob? Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Good information to have. Um, all right, so um, do other DRB members have thoughts on this four inch exemption or exception? I think, I think we've discussed through and shown that there's a, a, a appropriate reason for, for allowing this request. All right. Um, very good. So with that, we have completed our review of the standards that apply to this project. Um, any other questions from DRB members or final comments from the applicant? Okay, hearing none, I would entertain a motion. Liz, Liz has another question. Okay, All I'll right. take one last question. Go ahead, Lizbeth. And I'd also like to um, give a nod to Chris and see if she has any more questions as well. But one has to do with lighting and I haven't heard lighting discussed which is something that and trees, which are something that has significantly changed in this neighborhood over the last few years. I don't know what section it may apply under, but there has been a loss of considerable number of trees, including one that was on this property. So there has been a change previous to uh, this application for, uh, for building on this, but there was, um, a significant change in the natural vegetation that was here. Just put that out mm -hmm. there. But lighting there, and I've discussed this with, with Peter, there, whether it's a reflection from another home or whether it's a reflection from a, or whether it's a light on the back of this house, it, it really um, is detrimental to uh, the lighting in this area for a number of homes that surround it. I'm wondering what standard this might be under and whether or not we could discuss uh, lighting as this. Um, and so just for that lighting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm gonna 
let Meredith add, but um, because this is only before the development review board, because of the construction on steep slopes, there are not particular lighting standards that this project is subject to um, in the same way that a change of use would be or, or a more intensive use of the site. Um, Meredith, is that correct? Um, partly. I mean, it's, it's not even just because it's only before the DOB on slopes. It's also because this is a single family home. Um, and right. so the lighting standards and the landscaping standards are part of site plan review which only applies to projects that are of a use that is more intense than up to two, two units, two dwelling units, parcels. Um, so single family homes and parcels with two dwelling units on them aren't, the, the, the lighting and landscaping just don't apply to those. Same okay, with um, character of the neighborhood issues. Those don't apply in this particular application. So there's uh, no way to address them, and that's unfortunate. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. Question for Meredith. Meredith, with the new ordinance, is there a section that uh, un under uh, general general requirements that deals with a, with lighting in residential neighborhoods? Um, not not really. No. Um, it's like I said the lighting um hold on one second no. I'm, just, I'm, well, Meredith is, I'm flipping through things that's fine and while meredith is looking um you know we're, we're taking our time so that we can do this right and i acknowledge that that's an investment of everybody's time so as you're sitting here at your computer at the end of a long day i, I hope everyone will feel very free to get up and move around we we're going to follow process but we don't need to be or, overly formal please feel free to stretch and move around um, since this is kind of an awkward way to be for a long period of time. Um, so Kevin, just because I wanted to double check to make sure I wasn't somehow not remembering something. Um, yeah, the, the lighting requirements are all under site plan standards. So, I mean, it does sometimes apply to certain projects in residential neighborhoods because you can have residential neighborhoods that have um, you know, properties with three units on them or four units on them. But like I said, if you're talking about a property with a, just a single family home on it or up to two dwelling units, you don't have other uses involved that are commercial and could trigger site plan analysis. We don't, we, we don't ask questions about lighting. It's just not something that falls under the zoning purview for these particular projects. They're exempt from those standards. Thanks for double checking that. Yeah, thank you, Meredith. Yeah. Okay, so um, Elizabeth had a chance to speak, so I want to invite Christine. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, thank you, Kate. I understand Liz's concerns, um, certainly, and I also understand that um, the concerns don't fall under the purview of um, the application as it's before DRB. So thank you. You're welcome. And um, I, I should allow the applicant to have any last comments as well. Yeah, thank you, Kate. No, we're, I don't believe we have anything to add okay. at this point. Okay, thank you. In that case, I'd entertain a motion. Just a, a procedural question, uh, Kate. Uh, oftentimes, and this 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 application is probably it's not required, but I just want to make sure we cover this, particularly as we get into the agenda this evening. Um, in in uh, in applications that have multiple issues that require research, and the fact that we're dealing with a new zoning ordinance, uh, uh, we as a board may decide to enter into deliberative session to consider and to rule on a particular application. I just want to refresh everybody's memory on that for those that have been on the board and just bring that up um, for the new members who haven't had this experience yet. Thank you, Kevin. That's a good reminder that sometimes we do choose to go into a private deliberative session to, to work through certain things. Um, are you proposing that, Kevin, for this application or just a general reminder? General reminder, not necessarily for this application. I'm going to defer to okay. other members. Okay, thanks. Uh, 
I feel like we've vetted the vetted what we need to vet, and there's not a lot that's left unanswered or additional information needed. So, um, if, if others agree, then um, I would welcome a motion. So moved. RJ, thank you. Um, and would you um, would you specify um, we are moving approval with for steep a steep uh, construction on steep slopes with the condition that a revised stormwater plan approved by DPW will be submitted by the applicant? Yes. Or something like that. Yeah. Great. Thank you, RJ. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion by RJ, second by Kevin. I'm going to do a roll call where we say yes or no. All right. Um, the motion has been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion by DRB members? Oh, just the uh, qualification that uh, as a condition of approval that uh, we are requiring a updated uh, stormwater plan that will be submitted and approved by DPW uh, prior to the issuance of a permit. Uh, that would be a, yeah. a friendly, friendly amendment to the motion. Great. Thank you for um, more fully articulating that um, part of the motion. Uh, Kevin, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, friendly amendment accepted by RJ. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, Michael, did you want to add something? Uh, I'll vote yes. Okay. Michael, is it yes? Uh, RJ? Yes. Yes. Rob? Yes. Joe? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Dean? Yes. And I, Kate, am voting yes as well. Thank you all for participating. Um, Meredith will be in touch about uh, the next steps uh, to getting your project underway. Thank um, you. Yeah, so just oh, as a Reminder, um, and this is also helpful for anybody who hasn't been on here. Um, so I will, will will be working on the written decision um, that will get drafted. Uh, the chair will need to approve that and sign off on it. And then we will send that to you. Um, you can feel free to start working on the revised stormwater plan before you get that decision, because we've talked about what needs to be in that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, if we if you've met all the conditions, even before the written decision goes out, then we'll probably be able to issue the written decision and the permit together. If we don't have that stormwater plan that's approved by DPW yet, you'll get the written decision first, and then we'll issue the permit once we have that stormwater plan. And that would just be administratively approved at that point, correct? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not. It, yeah, kind of. It's not administratively approved officially, but it's, I look at it, it doesn't have to go back for the DRB. As long as BPW is happy with it, I'll accept it in the file. Yep. And that's just the condition for issuing the permit. Very good. Great. Great. Thank you all. Thank all right. You. Thank you. Thank you. And Meredith and all right. everyone in the DRB there, I'm sure this was a big lift to get live on this platform. So thank you all for your hard work getting this, getting things moving along. I really appreciate it. You're most yeah. welcome. I I, I just wanted to thank yeah. you too. I, I thought for, for a first run, you guys did great. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Bye -bye. All right so I'm Have just going to pause. Night. You too. Have a good night. I'm going to pause for just uh, 30 seconds or so while people um, sort of sign off if they're not continuing on the call because we are about to move on to the next application on our agenda, which is 105 State Street. Okay, I need a little technical assistance in getting myself back into the meeting here. I, I hit something. I hit something. I'm not sure how to get my my image back up on the screen. So uh, I can see you. You can see me. I can't see myself. I can see you. Do you have a little um, minimize anything else you have on your screen? Okay. And well. then see if maybe it's reduced to a little single square and you need to enter full screen. Share, not share screen. Not uh, share screen. Not share screen. Not share screen. At the upper right hand corner, oh, you should have a little enter full screen mode. Okay, so show self view. I bet you that's it. Let me try it. There I am. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Just, just the new technology, <laughs> folks. <laughs> All right. Are there any other technical questions we want to resolve before moving on? 
Great. Okay. You'll see. Um, that's. I'm just making sure I've got the appropriate documents up on my computer. So give me. Okay. Very good. Um, 105 State Street is our next application, and this is being reviewed for a few different items. Um, we are undertaking a major site plan, conditional use, and design review. Um, so different sets of standards um, for this project. Um, and I'll just reiterate the order of testimony. We'll hear from staff. We'll hear from the applicant. DRB members will ask questions. Um, we'll hear from others who would like to comment on the project, if there are any, um, and then we'll continue the discussion and deliberation from there. Okay? All right. So at this point, I will swear in folks who would like to speak on the 105 State Street application. So if you'd be so kind as to raise your right hand, I'll swear you in. Anyone wishing to testify? All right. Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. I do. I do. Thank you all. Um, I, we also, um, we had a site visit option for this um, project, which I, I appreciated. And so I would just like to um, have board members um, disclose by raising their hands if they did um, go to the site and look around. So board members, if you did a site visit, please raise your hand. Okay, great. So just about everybody did a, a site visit. Um, no. Michael, Thank you. since you can't raise your hand, can you just let us know whether or not you did a site visit? Um, I didn't do a site visit, but I, I work at 107, so I'm familiar with the location. Okay. okay, and could you just could you describe 107? It sounds obvious, but could you describe 107 in relation to 105? Um, I just I think it's useful to have a, a disclosure if you work for a neighboring business. Um, you should have left it right back before. I came what, what is that? I, I didn't catch what oh, you asked. Could you, oh, so my my question is describe where 107 is, and um, as in doing so, I would I would take that as a disclosure that you work for a neighboring business. Uh, correct. One, 107 is the old Thrush Tavern building, sits behind 105, and I work for a law firm in that building that has no affiliation with the applicant. Okay. And um, I think because of our policies related to conflicts of interest or appearance of, I just, I need to ask you that, forgive me, I need to ask you the question, do you feel that you can um, fairly and impartially review this application? Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate it. Um, okay. Um, are there, all right. Meredith, would you like to provide an overview of the application? Sure. And just, just to make sure, um, is there anybody who is part of this that is going to be objecting to Michael Lazarczak taking part in the decision making on this application? I don't see any issue since he disclosed that he works next door, but I want to provide opportunity for people to object if they feel they need to. Oh, thank you, Meredith. No, Meredith, the applicant has no objection. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to, you know, I, I could go on a really long time just to talk about what this project is, but I'm going to try and keep it really short. Um, so the applicant seeks major site plan approval for a new three-story building with a commercial use on the first floor, including conditional use approval for a drive-up bank teller and ATM at the rear of the building. Um, there's also a new curb cut for vehicles exiting onto Governor Aiken Avenue. Um, the subject parcel is located in the Urban Center 1 zoning district. This is important because there are a variety of requirements that might have applied in some other zoning district that don't here. Um, a lot of those are like landscaping requirements, on-site parking requirements. Because this is in the UC downtown, um, we've, we've been able to just skip over those in the analysis of the staff report. Um, this parcel is also located in the design control district. Um, and so it was evaluated by the design review committee. Um, so just to talk a little bit about the history, 
This application was reviewed um, by the Technical Review Committee on April 22nd. So this is a committee where it doesn't have a public hearing, but it's um, a collection of the departmental chairs who have an interest in the project. Um, we have a meeting with the applicant and confer over issues and ask questions. That's all reflected in the staff report. Um, and then the design review committee reviewed the application during a May 4th public hearing. Um, again, in the staff report, the, the, that review has been described. Um, there was one recommended change and then a couple of optional changes. Um, those are items that the development review board is going to need to determine whether or not to incorporate into the um, any decision as whether or not to incorporate those as conditions or not. And then as Kate mentioned, um, there was an op opportunity for site plan um, to go visit the site. Um, and then there are really like seven categories of outstanding issues. So these are highlighted in the staff report, but I'm just gonna list them really quick. Um, so there's the vehicle access and circulation requirements under section 3010. Um, there is a requirement in the, the um, dimensional parking space requirements for a 20 foot aisle width behind parking spaces for parking lots when there's two way traffic. There's a question of how that applies in the situation where you have three parking spaces with what is supposed to be a two way access behind it. Is that really an aisle in a parking lot or not? It's unclear, it's a gray area. Um, another item is whether or not the drive through portion of the proposal meets the um, special use standards of section 3115, as well as the conditional use standards. Um, again, I, I mentioned previously the design review committee recommendations. So that's one thing you're gonna have to look at and make a determination on. Um, also, how the applicant has to meet planning specifications um, for the landscaping that is proposed whether the parking area has to be screened from abutting, abutting properties, which is required for parking lots. Again, is this a parking lot? Parking lots aren't actually defined. And then um, whether the applicant has met the professionally prepared lighting plan requirement of section 3204. Um, I believe we have um, some interested parties on the line, just so that you're aware, uh, the Patrick on here, I believe is Patrick Malone. And then there's Alicia Feeler and Phil Zallinger who are all on with regard to the abutting property 99 State Street. And that is my overview, unless there's overview type questions. Otherwise I'm gonna hand it back to Kate. Are there overview type questions? There will be time for questions. All right. Um, very good. So with that, I would like to invite the applicants to talk a little bit about the project, elaborate on anything that um, you'd like to highlight. Um, after you do that, um, we'll ask you questions and then we will proceed through the um, staff report in order to address the, the big seven that uh, Meredith highlighted. So I'll turn it over over to the applicants. Uh, thanks very much. We'll defer to uh, Brian and Jay to give the presentation and jump in where we feel it's necessary. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm Brian Lane Furness with Dwell Engineering. I'm the site engineer for the project. Uh, you were uh, all already introduced to Tom Lozon, who's the applicant uh, through 105 State Street LLC. Uh, we also have here representing the applicant tonight, uh, Jay Ansel and Andrew McCullough from Black River Design, who are project architects. Uh, as well as the project landscape architect, Bob White. Um, so I'm going to take over the screen uh, and start the presentation. Um, while I'm going through sort of general presentation of the project, I'm going to try and pick up the things from the staff report. So excuse me if I'm um, going back and forth a little bit and shuffling paper uh, and trying to point at the screen. Um, but just sort of by way of introduction to the project, the project's a new uh, three-story building uh, located on 105 
Street. So uh, on this plan down here is State Street. Uh, here is Governor Davis Avenue. And then this is the intersection with Taylor to the south. Um, this is the pavilion building uh, owned by the state. Um, back here is uh, 107 State, the former Thrush. And then over here is 99 State, uh, which people may know as the um, Associated Industries of Vermont building. Um, so as I said, the proposed project is a three-story building um, shown with this gray uh, shading here. Um, the proposed uses for the building are, are bank and office. Um, one sort of distinctive feature of the project uh, that's um, driven by the city uh, floodplain regulations is that the first floor of the building is uh, six and a half feet higher than the sidewalk elevation out in front of it. Um, so I think Jay and the folks at Black River have, have done a really nice job um, making the building relate to the street and fit into the streetscape uh, at the same time with um, meeting the Montpelier requirement to elevate the first floor of the building two feet higher than the floodplain. Um, so there's a significant uh, stairway here, concrete stairway that leads up into the recessed main entrance of the building right here. Um, there is a lower um, entry lobby here um, that will provide accessible entrance into the building. Um, so when you go in here, there'll be an elevator that'll have a half floor stop up to the first floor and then continue on up to, to access the other two floors. Um, there are two exits from emergency stairwells here and there, uh, as well as a, 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 um, a ground story uh, enclosure for storing trash back here in the northwest corner of the site. Um, and then here uh, along the frontage, there's also going to be a, a significant raised planter area. It's going to have two um, tiers in it. Uh, and when we get to that section, I'll let um, Rob describe that in a little more detail. Um, we are planning to extend a five foot sidewalk up the west side of the building um, to provide access to this, the egress door back here. Um, and we had some discussion about that with the TRC and, and in the end that's gonna remain a, a private sidewalk for the time being uh, maintained by the applicant. Um, as Meredith said, um, despite the fact in the UC1 district, there are no requirements to provide parking, we are uh, choosing to provide three parking spaces here along the east side of the building, um, two regular spaces and one uh, van accessible ADA space. Um, and the other major feature of the project is that there is a um, ATM and remote teller uh, window proposed at the back of the uh, building here for the bank. Uh, so uh, drive through uh, coming up the uh, existing uh, shared right of way and then going along the back of the building with one service space and two stacking spaces uh, and then a, an exit only the new curb cut here on Governor Davis Avenue. So that's the sort of general overview of the project. Um, the, let's bring up the renderings here. So the, the uh, I, uh, being the engineer, I won't talk extensively about the architectural design here, but um, as you can see, it's, it's the building is um, well designed to meet the design review and um, specific district architectural standards um, with the brick uh, and granite facade here. Um, so in this, in this uh, perspective, you can see the stairway and then the tiered uh, landscaping. Um, this is the main door, and this over here is the entry into the um, elevator lobby. Um, so this is a general idea of the, the sort of architectural design of the building. Um, as Meredith said, we did go through a re review of the design review committee that had one um, uh, item that they um, had a recommended alteration um, to make the concrete match the color of the granite and then a couple of optional items for the applicant to consider. Um, and then I would like to talk a little bit about the access and circulation on the project. Um, so uh, just to generally talk about access and circulation, um, we are providing pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicle access to the project. Um, pedestrian access is mainly from the, the existing city sidewalk network and um, again, several ways for pedestrians to access the building from the existing sidewalk. Um, we are providing uh, down in this area here, three of the sort of inverted U style bike racks um, for bicycle parking at the site. 
Um, there's a couple of um, benches, which are a little hard to see on this point, so I'll zoom in. Um, here and here, we're proposing benches, and then another one up here um, by the uh, accessible way to get around to the, to the front of the building. So those, these are what we designed to, I think the application says granite, but they've been revised to be um, designed to match the other benches that are um, around in the city. So metal side rails, and I think they're composite um, decking for the seats. Um, in terms of vehicle circulation, um, there is a, a 10 and a half foot shared right of way um, along the eastern side of the property here. Um, the right of way is shared with 99 and 107 State Street. Um, this right of way has been here for a very long time um, and similar to many other properties in the downtown area. Um, though it is less than what would currently be considered wide enough for two way access, um, it is and has always been uh, a two-way um, access in and out of this parcel uh, and to the, the two abutting uh, properties as well. Um, you know, if you think of where the old gas station was, you may think to yourself that this proposal reduces the width of the access here, um, but functionally, we're actually keeping it the same as it was previously. Um, so this is a Google um, Maps street view image of what the the property looked like uh, back when the former gas station and service station was on the property. Um, and as you can see, they regularly used the side of the building here um, to park vehicles that were um, either stopping by at the station or, or for service. Um, and you can see the back of the cars roughly line up with the edge of the uh, 107 State Street building here, um, which is more or less uh, the edge of the right of way. Uh, unfortunately, you can't see it in this view, but the back of those parked cars in that picture were lined up right about at the back of these parking spaces here. So essentially this configuration maintains the previous and historical um, width and direction of access um, through this shared right of way. Um, there was some discussion about um, cars accessing these um, parking spaces both in terms of the width of the aisle and uh, in terms of the um, potential for conflicts with pedestrians walking along the sidewalk. Um, so I'll address those uh, one at a time. Uh, in terms of the width of the access, uh, the 20-foot access is required for um, net parking. Um, so the, the, the um, regulations when you have an angled park, uh, you know, a not less than 90 degree angled parking such as we have it designed here, um, just due to the space limitations of the site, um, then it needs to meet uh, engineering standards uh, in order for people to be able to get in and out of the parking spaces. Um, so the 11.7 foot access aisle here, we analyzed with our um, turn movement software and, and cars can certainly have plenty of room to um, back safely out of these parking spaces and, and leave the site. Um, in terms of conflicts with um, backing cars and pedestrians along the street, uh, after the TRC meeting, we provided this figure because most of the concern was centered around the accessible space. Um, so one of the reasons we put the accessible space down at the southern end of the site, um, one was to just provide the shortest path for an accessible route to the accessible entrance to the building. And two, because of the um, potential for conflicts with the pedestrians here, we wanted to put the lowest use spot, the closest to the sidewalk. Um, but this is um, some output from our turning movement software, um, which illustrates that because of this striped access aisle, which will be restricted from anyone parking in it, similar to any um, accessible space, um, a car, and this, what is illustrated here is um, quite a large car. It's um, what's called a design vehicle that the Association of Transportation and Highway, um, I forget what the O is, officials probably, um, provides as a, as a design vehicle and it's, it's a boat really. Um, so this, even this very large uh, passenger vehicle um, can back out in this sort of this red path here illustrates backing out. Here's the back of the car at its rearward most um, point. Um, you can see there's a, a very small amount of conflict with the sidewalk, but certainly plenty of room for people to still pass by. The car can then go forward and using the space of the striped aisle can then exit um, without having to back up any further. Um, 
DPW did review that and um, their assessment of the potential for conflicts was that they were still exist, but are minimal and, and they didn't express any um, particular concern after we uh, provided this um, illustration. Um, and then I know another concern that was raised in the staff report was the way that um, folks who do park in these parking spaces would be able to uh, then leave the parcel without having to traverse areas that they don't have legal access to. So there's two options uh, for anyone who's parked here. If the drive through is not in use at the time, uh, they can certainly just turn left and go out the drive through. Um, if the drive through is in use, um, then we would anticipate that they would be able to um, go up the right of way here and then using the backing space into the drive through be able to turn around and head back out um, along the common right of way. So um, regardless of whether the drive through is in use or not, there exists the possibility for people using those parking spaces to exit the property uh, without um, going off of areas that the uh, applicant has legal right to uh, traverse. Um, I think of that, let me just double check if there's anything else I wanted to bring up at this point on around access. Oh, uh, there was some question about whether the, the width of the access is sufficient because it, it doesn't meet the B71 standard of 24 feet for two-way access. Um, again, this is um, an existing access situation in the very heart of the downtown core. It's common uh, in the downtown Montpelier for there to be these um, one way with two way circulation uh, access points. They're kind of scattered all around the city. Um, and while um, you can't fit two cars down at the same time, um, you know, everyone is used to the situation and um, while there may be some times that you have to wait for someone, uh, it's sort of a, a feature of getting to the parking in downtown Montpelier. Um, and this existing situation here is really no different than any of the other um, one way with two way access uh, alleyways that access parking uh, around the downtown core. Um, the B71 standards are really uh, written for access onto state highways. Um, and so it's, it's um, well, many towns adopt them uh, as their access standards to commercial um, commercial developments. In the case of an infill development in the downtown core, that 24 foot width, width really just isn't appropriate or applicable to this particular site. Um, there was also in, on, on the access section. Um, the, if you have a corner lot, there's a provision that the, uh, the, the regulations want you to access the lot from the secondary street rather than from the primary street, uh, State Street being a class run roadway. Um, we can't shut down this access, uh, and nor do I think it would benefit the project or the safety of the general circulation of the downtown area to shut this access. But the most relevant thing being, this is a, there are other um, parties that have shared right to access this driveway off of State Street. So we have no uh, legal authority to close it off and only access the site from uh, the secondary road, Governor Davis Avenue. Um, uh, just to point this out, because it came up as a question in TRC, um, obviously we have very minimal snow storage on this site. Um, so we are going to have to simply remove the snow uh, when it snows in the winter, similar to other downtown developments. Um, the applicant is willing to use the two non-accessible spaces to temporarily store snow um, before removing it from the site. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, so then there are also were some comments in the staff report about the uh, particular use standards around the drive through, um, in particular, the provision that um, light and noise from the drive through would not unduly adversely affect adjacent property owners. Um, so uh, you can see in the renderings and also per the, oh, that signs right in the way. Here we go. Um, per the requirements of the zoning regulations, we are providing a canopy over the drive through. Um, so the drive-through lighting will be under this canopy um, and downcast and fully shielded. Um, so there's no um, particular excessive amount of lighting. Uh, it will, all the lighting will be directed down right onto the drive-through area. 
Um, in terms of noise, the only noise that this um, drive through uh, teller, uh, remote teller window would create would be the actual talking between the, the teller and the, uh, the folks in the car. Um, so that's really no louder than anyone else who's walking down the street uh, talking. And also the teller will only be there during the bank hours. Um, so at night, uh, the ATM will really not generate any noise at all. Uh, you know, if it's available for ATM use, it won't generate any noise um, at all. So um, given the downtown setting um, and the really non-residential nature of the surrounding buildings, um, we don't see any undue uh, adverse impacts uh, due to light or noise from the drive-through. Um, and then I think the next section I may ask uh, Rob to do a little uh, presentation on the landscaping. Uh, there's some question about whether the parking uh, was required to be um, screened if it was a parking lot or not. Um, and then there was also a question about um, adequate space, uh, planting space for the plants. So let me just bring up, I believe it's, here we go, the landscaping plan and, and ask Rob to just address those couple of things. I'm sorry, Bob, I keep saying Rob and I need to say Bob. My apologies, Bob. I think you're still muted though. Yeah, go ahead when you're ready, Bob. There we go, okay. I, I reserve people to uh, who call me Rob for a sp uh, special treatment. So that's, <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. So um, sounds um, like Mr. White is the way to go. <laughs> oh, that's what. Yeah, then I'm really in trouble. Um, so so we we uh, we worked with the project team to bring some uh, uh, in in a fairly small space to bring to try to bring some landscape value to the building. And um, I think really, I think as we all know that, you know, the, the major landscape uh, areas of the building are basically the street frontage onto State Street. And to some, and to some degree, the uh, sort of side driveway area um, with the idea that people viewing down that driveway, it'd be nice to have a little break from um, just, uh, just hard pavement and parked cars. But it's a very small space. And so uh, it's a fairly simple um, treatment that we're looking at. So um, the, as, you, as you saw in the renderings of the building, the, the major sort of uh, feature of the front of the building is the stairway that goes up in two, two sets of stairs that go up to the entrance, which is uh, I think it's six and a half feet or so above, above the sidewalk level of the street. And so, you know, the first thing we wanted to do is to make sure that there was a landing on that. Is there a way for me to point? Can I claim a pointer? I don't know if I can. Anyway, so right in the center is the stairwell. And so the first uh, really is the strategy in terms of pick, uh, sort of uh, addressing that grade there was the two tiered um, retaining uh, garden spaces that, that are on the corner of uh, Governor Aiken Avenue and State Street, and then wrapping those around the corner to engage with the stairwell or the stairway that goes up from the, the State Street sidewalk. So, um, so you can see in the renderings, these are probably a little small, but there's, there's public seating out in front and the first tier of that retaining wall there is, is basically at sort of seating height um, to make it comfortable for a pedestrian to, you know, or someone com coming by and, and make it feel like at a, at a sort of an, a, uh, an approachable scale that it's almost like sort of a social edge. And then we have two tiers of plantings that we've proposed in there. Um, uh, the lower level being sort of a, uh, you know, more of a garden-like feeling. Um, with room for annuals or perennials in the front, and then sort of a baseline of, of plant of, of plantings, and then on the upper something, some plant materials, more sort of a uh, sort of a sort of a bar, sort of a mass of, of planting. Looking at uh, winterberry in there to have wonderful red berries all through the winter, and, and have some seasonal different seasonal uh, effect there to make people happy in the middle of the winter as they're walking down 
called Windy State Street. So that's on the left side. And on the right side, we have the lower entrance that serves as the accessibility. So in a very small space, we have seating areas, we have accessibility to the elevator, we have accessibility around the corner of the building down the driveway to the handicap space and handicap ramp, and then, and then the and, and bicycle racks. So there's a lot going on in a small space. But I think really what we came to was that that would be a great space to have um, to be, you know, to have a street tree. And so looking at ways to fit that in. So um, I know Meredith is going to go and give us sort of line and verse on the standard. So uh, I brought you two different approaches to this for conversation purposes. Um, the, as, as was shown in the drawing that was submitted, I think that we didn't properly delineate the amount of space uh, allocated to the tree planting to the landscape standards of the city. So we've gone back and sharpened our pencil on that. So we really have two choices here um, uh, of what we can do. And it's basically a larger or a smaller tree. And so, um, so we, we had originally suggested in, our, in the application to use uh, what's called a Freeman maple. It's a, high, it's a sort of a crossbreed of red and silver maple that's um, a really quite an elegant tree. Um, uh, and, uh, but what I didn't specify on that was that there are different forms of it. And so uh, Meredith appropriately went and did a Google search on what a Freeman maple is and found that the Morton Arboretum in Minnesota or Wisconsin said it would grow to be 60 feet tall. Um, so there are different varieties of, uh, of Freeman maple that we, that we looked at. So, so what I've got here in the lower right um, frame there is basically taking uh, you know, a more upright version. The Armstrong Freeman maple is a cross of the Armstrong red, ma red maple with silver maple. So it's more of an upright form. It's more compact, more vertical, um, and fits a little better in there than a normal wi wider spreading uh, Freeman maple might be because, it, again, it's a fairly small space. Although we have the full extent to overhang onto the sidewalk also for shade. So you can see in this picture, as an example, right, uh, there's a, it's, it's partially cut off, but to the right, you can see uh, one of the trees that's in the front yard of the um, insurance company that's right next door. And I think that's Bob, the I think I've, character. Bob, I'm trying to give you control of the pointer so that you can point while you're talking. I, I don't know if you want to give it a try. Okay. Are you going to give it to me? I'm, I'm currently trying to, you know, I've okay. said it to, give it to you. I don't know if you see anything or if you can just move it around on your own. I'm moving it around. Is that anyone seeing that? No, I'm not seeing it. All right. Well, we okay. tried. Keep going. Sorry. Okay. So anyway, so we tried out. So we're, we're giving you a visual for a larger tree. The tree, the, the tree that's in back into the driveway in recognizing that that was a small space. We had originally proposed a, uh, a columnar Siberian crab apple in there, a really handsome uh, tree at a different scale. So if you're uncomfortable that we haven't got the amount of square footage for the planting area for a larger tree up front, um, one thing that would make sense would be to basically do two of the crab apples and, and have them be a little matched pair there. Um, but I have to be honest, I'll permission to speak freely is I, I think we might be disappointed out on the street to have a diminutive tree out there where we really want something a little more gracious, a little more generous. So. So uh, showing those different things. Now, Brian, can you scoop me off to the right and maybe zoom out a little bit? There are a couple of materials that we're using in the patio. Um, not sure whether this has been used around Montpelier. The upper frame there uh, in color is a material that's called FlexiPave. Uh, and essentially it's a pliable, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a material that is, starts as a liquid, it is poured and troweled in place like concrete, but it's, uh, it's permeable, allows water to flow through it, and you can mix different kinds of uh, aggregate stone into it so that it looks like sort of a crushed stone like surface. But people can walk on it and it's a very firm and stable um, surface that we're using around the trees because there's so little space, people are gonna walk on the, on the tree wells. 
But underneath that, and this is the second part of the conversation, you can go down a little bit more and pull to the left. Perfect. So you see the, uh, oop, right there, perfect. So you can see in the lower right of the image um, is the was the uh, is the footprint uh, area that we're proposing for the Freeman Maple, and so um, uh, what we had noted in the plan for the application was that that would be placed in silva cells, and but I didn't really elaborate upon that, um, and so uh, now we are. So what we what I think the issue with uh, for the Freeman maple is that it, it is a larger tree and it requires a greater amount of soil volume in order to grow and thrive. So the combination of the flexi pave with um, what's called a silva cell, which is essentially a plastic uh, grid like uh, framework that is set in underneath the, the level of the sidewalk, basically holds up the sidewalk and then allows the space underneath it to be filled with um, good quality planting soil. So the tree actually has the same volume of planting soil um, as long as it gets water uh, through it, which is why the flexi pave is there, is that it allows the tree to grow and be and thrive. So this would contrast, uh, you know, historically street trees in many, in many uh, New England cities and not Montpelier is not, no stranger to this. And mostly they were, you know, you dig, a, you dig a hole in the sidewalk three or four feet square and you dump the tree in and try to get some manure and compost and water in there and hope that it grew and it usually wouldn't. So this, you know, we're almost quadrupling uh, a normal amount of street tree uh, uh, preparation for, for this tree on the corner. Um, with the silver cells. And then basically we bring the sidewalk over the top of, of the silver cells, which hold it up. And then we fill in the square. So we essentially, we can meet the 100 square foot requirement that Meredith has uh, outlined in, in the requirements for that tree, um, uh, you know, to, to fit that in place. And so those brown, each of those brown rectangles is a two foot by four foot silver cell unit. So we've got four, a, we've got nine units um, around under the sidewalk. And then under, under the um, flexi pay, we can just use regular planting soil and just tamp it in um, you know, firmly in place and, and uh, it'll be stable, people can walk on it. So I guess at the risk, and there's, you know, there's a technical drawing up, up or to, the upper, uh, to the left of that, the silver cells can go down different depths depending on how deep uh, utilities and other things are. Uh, we typically go down, uh, we don't go down. In an unusual situation, we could go down as far as three feet. I think we probably want to be more like two feet here. So we're just a little below the level of the curbing out on the street, but not having a huge uh, excavation, you know, right in the middle of, of the, you know, right next to the sidewalk on, uh, on State Street there. So these are well, um, founded uh, techniques for urban planting now. Um, so yeah, I think at that point I'm gonna stop and, and uh, either questions or let Brian keep going. And... Okay, thank you, Bob. It's good to know that street trees have a much better chance than they have had in the past owing to these they technologies. Do. And that gives the board an opportunity to contemplate what different size trees could be appropriate because either could thrive. Um, Great. So, um, Brian, did you have have more or? Um... Yeah, just a couple more things yeah. I just wanted to to hit on uh, from the staff report before we we turn it over for the uh, board to ask questions. Um, I think the next section was lighting, which uh, Jay or um, Andrew, I think from Black River, was going to address. All right, I would invite um, Jay and or Andrew to unmute and talk a little about lighting, please. Go right ahead. Jay, it looks like you're trying to talk, but you're still muted. Brian, I'm gonna um, just take you off share screen so that I can see what's going on with everybody. Now I can see my, I don't appear to be muted here. No, nope, I can, can hear, hear you now, you. Jay. 
Okay. Okay, so one of the questions that had come up, uh, we, are, we are not introducing any sight lighting per se. We're introducing lighting that uh, enables one to see at points of entry, just to come up the stairs um, and uh, at the, the grade level door, um, at the one of the, both of the side doors and also at the, the uh, drive up um, banking location. Uh, all of these are less than the the 2000 lumens for which one is required to have a, a, uh, a lighting plan. Uh, one of them, a couple of our wall sconces have 533 uh, for those. Um, another wall sconce has a thousand lumen. And then we have a, a, a recessed fixture which would be underneath the canopy at the drive up, which would be 770. Um, so those are, are the total of those are 7,000. I think there's also a break off at 13,000 that one might need a lighting plan. So we should be fine relative to no sort of light spill beyond our property uh, or a bright source. Um, building, I hate to be, you know, last but not least, I hope. Um, do we, or shall I go into some of the features of the building and why the design is as it is? Sure, that would be fine. Brian, can you bring up the, um, on the elevation sheets, the one that has State Street as the south and west? Yeah, uh, well, you're, there you are. Okay, done. So looking primarily at the lower right, which is the State Street, we are, as you all know, in the historic district and an important aspect of design in, uh, is responding to context. Montpelier certainly has a mix of uh, periods and styles, materials, uh, and massings. Um, and it's a challenge, as, as was mentioned, we have to be six and a half feet above grade with our first floor. Um, that was sort of a prime generator of the planting and two level planters on the left, rather than simply have our billing up six and a half feet and having the front facade have that sort of blank wall, we came up with the concept of this stepped planter so that it would sort of mitigate a bit that, that height. And then the staircase has been uh, indicated to go into the central. And on the right-hand side, we are able to enter at grade. We come into an elevator lobby, which will then take us up a half a flight uh, to the main level. Um, in looking at sort of contextual responses, these are there are a number of elements in this building that are seen in other buildings within the historic district. Um, much of our retail storefront, you'll see where there's larger glass openings on the main floor, and our first floor has some of that sort of larger glass in response. Uh, the upper level in many of the historic buildings uh, have what we'd call sort of punched openings or individual windows, and this follows that pattern. There's also a greater floor to floor height of the first floor, as is uh, evident in other buildings in, in Montpelier. And then you get sort of shorter floor to floor heights in the second and third level and windows in a similar fashion respond whether they are, are a little smaller and shorter as, as it goes up. Um, we have some breakup of the facade with sort of the tower section on the right, which responds to some of the functions there. Uh, we've picked materials that you see in many of the quality buildings uh, in Montpelier with a combination of brick and granite. And those are the prime materials of the building more or less throughout. Um, we've created a granite sign band. At this point, we're not applying for signage, but just it's sort of generic, but it does create this sort of banding division between that, that retail level and levels above. We've also, to help with the interest in the brick, you see a number of sort of uh, and perhaps you see it both in this one and in the, el the elevation to the left, these horizontal um, soldier course sort of corbelled bands where we create uh, a lateral breakup of the building. And then another piece that is evident in many of the historic buildings in Montpelier at the cap or top, uh, we do a fair amount of corbelling which creates sort of a, a proper uh, top or cornice to the building. Again, another element that you see in many of the, of the downtown buildings. Um, we had presented through before design review. They liked the building, but asked for a couple things that we might do where the elements that are concrete rather than granite that we tint those such that they would, they would be the same uh, 
colors the granite, which we will do. Um, one of the things that came out in technical review on that uh, west elevation of the one on the left, um, a concern which is understandable for sort of plowing, we are going to that granite base at the bottom, we're going to lift a couple more feet such that uh, there would be plow damage along the sidewalk in that area. Um, any questions on these facades? And otherwise, we'll move to the other. Okay, we're going to go to the other drawing. And this one will show um, on the left is the um, northerly or back of the building, and that's where the, car, the uh, drive up is. Uh, and that will be, a, there'll be a video screen. There won't be a teller right behind that, but it would be um, controlled by video. And then uh, on the east side, uh, there is a ATM machine beneath the canopy. And then moving to the right, there's a door that would provide access to the second and third floors and a directory. One of the things that design review asked is that perhaps we add a bit more sort of detail at that area, as well as by the um, drive up. Uh, there's an opening in the lower portion to the right. That's where one of the advantages, one of the few of raising our building six and a half feet, we're going to tuck uh, recycle and trash underneath the, that area in the doorway. Um, now let's move to the perspectives, which you showed a little bit of. Uh, so here's State Street, uh, both uh, south and west, again, showing the, the main entrance and the planting areas and the staircase above. And then the next one, sort of east and south. So this is certainly a prime, uh, a prime facade, as one is coming from sort of the retail as parts of, of, of Montpelier. You, as you see, there's still a fair amount of, of visibility of the tavern behind. And also to the left, with view corridor being important, you can see uh, the pavilion. And then the other two elevations. So this would be the sort of north and east sides with the pavilion still visible behind and then the back. So that's a quick tour of the building. Again, we've tried to sort of repeat what we think are quality materials and uh, with the combinations of brick and granite. Uh, and yet, be a product of our own time as a contemporary building as well. Great, thank you. Well, thank you all for the comprehensive overview um, of, of the project. Um, at this point, I will ask the, um, if the applicant wants to add anything else, then I'll have the DRB members ask a couple questions and then I'll open it up to the, um, to other folks who would wish to comment on this application. So. Um, Tom, I will turn it over to you and you can unmute if there's anything you'd like to add. Uh, just thank you. You really don't want me to add anything, do you? <laughs> so thank I you. I welcome your insight. You sound Thanks. like a lot of work here sometimes. <laughs> We're sure. proud of it. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Okay, so um, DRB members, keeping in mind that we are going to be walking through um, the staff report on this. Um, would you, are there, are there any items that you want answers to questions on right now before we get to those individual items on the staff report? General clarifications, points of interest um, from DRB members at this point, just raise your hand and let me know if you're interested because I can see you all now. Um, we'll, we'll go, we'll do Kevin and then Jean. Okay, just, just quickly. I mean, I think that uh, uh, we should just, we should, spend our time going through the staff report. There's a lot of good information in there. We want to spend uh, some quality time looking at the TRC uh, uh, report and uh, uh, asking the applicant to respond to that. Thank you, Kevin. I think that's a good direction to head. Um, Gene, did you want to ask something at this point? I'd welcome a question. Fair enough. I agree with Kevin. Thanks. Uh, let's okay. go through the reports. All right, that works too. Okay, great. So um, before we go through the reports, I said that I was going to invite testimony from others who wish to comment on this application. And I'm going to turn to Meredith, who I believe has a, um, a list of those who expressed interest. 
to make sure that we go through it systematically and, and get everybody. So Meredith, do you have that list and would you be willing to um, invite people to speak? Yes, well, we really have, there's three people on that are really all concerned because of the same reason. So Phil and Pat and Alicia, any of you have anything you wanna say? You might wanna unmute yourselves. Do you, um, we have some concerns, but would we, would it be better used as we went through the staff report for us to um, insert our comments there as they directly relate? Yeah, this is, this is Phil Zallinger. I, I have one preliminary question. I, I think Jay just testified that I, may, I might have misheard him. Is there an ATM on the eastern side of the building or is the ATM with the banking drive through window uh, both on the north side of the building? You're muted. They're both on the north. They're both on the north? No. The ATM is on the east. East side. So, but there's also a drive up ATM, correct? There's a drive up. I'm not sure what your other term would be, but it'll be, there would be where one uh, be like the vacuum tube, you know, what your traditional drive up yep. went. But there wouldn't be a tellers looking at you. That'll be done uh, by video. And then there's a walk up ATM on the east, not What's a drive up. Does the drive-through facility have an ATM feature? No. Oh. No, I don't believe so. Not a, that, that's not planned to be. Okay. I'm, Meredith is. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I misunderstood. I thought during the the TRC that there was discussion that during the off. Um, when the teller was not going to be available, that there was discussion about having an ATM feature on the northern facade through the drive up. So that you could drive up and function. Correct. Saying. That was my understanding. But if that's no longer part of the design or I misunderstood, I, then so be yeah. it. I don't know that it's been defined as such. I don't know. Um, Tom, would you have a feel for that? Yeah, there would there would likely Jay be an option uh, during off hours when the teller uh, when the teller station uh, does not have you know is not operable. There would be an ATM on the drive through side. So there would either be a walk up that hasn't been totally defined. Uh, my preference would be to have the ATM through the drive in the drive through at the same That's location as the uh, teller. So it could function both ways. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, it wouldn't. Okay, so I, I, so then so I, I would just note that the. Sorry, if I can jump in. I just note that the diagram we have indicates that there's an ATM window and pneumatic tube, um, positioned as part of the drive-through. Okay, so that sounds like that's what we should anticipate. That's correct. So, just just to be clear, two locations, one pure ATM, the second uh, with a pneumatic tube type of arrangement, which could also potentially be an ATM. So two potentially two ATM locations. Am I am I correct? Yes, Sounds sir. correct. Yes. Um, so does that answer your question? And um, yeah, would you like to ask anything else? Well, it's it's hard to to digest that subtle change in the project at this point. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure how the DRB would like to proceed here. Um, I would like to address on behalf of the joining property owner at 99 State some general issues so that when you do go through the, the staff report, you can, uh, the DRB can appreciate uh, some um, a different view of the evidence than Brian may have expressed. Um, under sure, so that, please go ahead with those general comments now. That's okay. fine for context. Yeah, thanks. Um, so section 3010 requires pro projects to be designed to prevent traffic conflicts within the site. I mean, that's the affirmative obligation of a party who brings a project before the DRB. 
Um, this applicant is elected to include parking on the site, even though none is required by the ordinance. They've affirmatively elected to incorporate parking in the, <clears throat> in the project design. And that has wide ranging ramifications for access and circulation, both on the 105 parcel and on that portion of the site, which includes the right of way. The right of way for the DRB's edification, the right of way is on land owned by 99 State Street. So 99 State Street owns the fee and it's subject to the rights of others to travel over and upon the right of way. It was created in a deed in February of 1925. And it provided that the right of way to be kept open and to be used in common by the parties, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an affirmative obligation in the creation of that right of way that it be kept open. <clears throat> Um, the drive width, as Brian acknowledged, is 11.71 feet. Um, fully 90% of that 11.71 feet is on 99 State Street. It's the right of the 10 and a half foot, 10.5 foot right of way on 99 State Street. Um, that the driveway, as Brian acknowledged also is presently used also by 107 State Street. That's the rear building, the former Thrush building. Um, I wonder how many more decades we're gonna call it the Thrush. I guess I we'll know someday. Um, they, that's used by 107 State Street for two-way traffic. They have, there's no other access, there's no other, 107 State Street has no other capability of leaving the site unless it uses this right of way to get to State Street. Um, 99 State Street uses the right of way only for egress from its site. Although it could use it for ingress, the, the rest of the circulation on 99 State Street makes clear that number one, there's an ATM and the ATM can only be accessed, it's a, it's a kiosk and it's set for a drive up and that is it's designed for cars exiting to the south to State Street. The former bank that was located there had a driving window and that was also accessed by using the right of way and 99 State Street for egress from the site to State Street. And also the configuration of the parking spaces in the rear of 99 State Street they're all designed for diagonal access and use, and you couldn't use them effectively at all without a three or four point, five point turn um, by coming in on that side of 99 State Street. In other words, using the right of way for ingress. So the circulation on 99 State Street is, if you're standing on State Street, is counterclockwise. 99 State Street enters to the right-hand side of 99 State and proceeds around and uses the common right-of-way that's a part of this project, really only for egress from the site because of the design features on 99 State. Um, Bill? Yes? Uh, would it be helpful for you if I pulled, did a share screen and pulled up the site plan and tried to point to where you were talking about, or do you just want to say, it's, keep the well, way that it might help the DRB. I mean, I, I, I'm certainly familiar with what I'm trying to say, but not everybody who's listening to me is always, is also completely familiar with what I'm trying to say. Okay, so 99 State Street is over here. You can't see the whole thing, but there's an alley on this side of 99 State Street where my arrow is. It correct. goes around and then they come out this way. That's correct. And that's because the parking at the rear of 99 State Street is on a diagonal. Okay. Put your cursor over just to the left of the wolf. Right in that area, there's okay. diagonal parking on 
two on two sides. Okay. And, and you couldn't use it unless you access, uh, unless the circulation was counterclockwise. So my, my point being that 99 state only uses the right of way for egress. There's, 99 does not enter there. Um, although 107 has no choice and has to use it for ingress and egress. Um, also back to the point that we made about the applicant selection to include parking. Uh, all of the parking, the, the free parking spaces that are provided, all of those, all of the vehicles using those parking spaces will have to back into the traveled right of way in order to exit that parking space. Brian pointed out that these vehicles could back into the right of way, proceed north past the queue for the drive-through and then back into the drive-through queue. Is that your cursor, Meredith? Yes. Yep. Do a three-point turn and then come out and exit that way. Um, that's, that's fairly laborious for each of those three parking the vehicles in each one of those three parking spaces in order to have to use that parking space and exit the site to have to do that. Um, I'm not sure what Brian meant when he pointed out that the, the oversized vehicle that would use the accessible parking space, he um, adroitly pointed out with his engineering equipment, how it can back up and and proceed north. But the question is when it proceeds north, where does it go? It, there's nowhere for it to go unless it too is gonna to back into the area where the queue is and then do a three point turn and turn around and exit and come back out. Yes, I, yes, that's, that's it. Uh, I'm not sure where it's to go unless it just goes up and backs into the queue area for the um, drive-through. But if any, if 107 is using its means of ingress and egress or other participant, uh, other users at 99 are using the ingress and egress and there's also cars queued up at the drive-through, then that vehicle is gonna have a hard time backing up and turning around to then proceed south to exit on the right of way. Uh, certainly, I, I think Brian's um, design was was intended to show that it wasn't going to encroach too too significantly on the sidewalk, but it didn't explain really how the vehicles going to uh, depart from the site. Um, so there's. We have a problem with the obstruction of traffic in the right of way by the inclusion of parking on the east side of the project site. Uh, we'd also point out that the drive through only has two stacking spaces. And that means there'd be one vehicle at the, at the site and two vehicle, room for two vehicles to stack. The third vehicle will not only obstruct the right of way in some small fashion, but it will also interfere with the circulation of all three of the, any of the vehicles who elect to leave the site from the parking spaces. Uh, I, I, I should point out, in addition that, the, that um, my client, Patrick Malone, who is under contract to purchase 99 State Street and will be closing that purchase in just several weeks, uh, has no objection to the project beyond these issues with access and circulation. It's a, it's a handsome building, it's, um, it's well-designed and Tom Lozon has a great team of folks that, um, advising him it's just in our view it's 
you're trying to fit 10 pounds into a five pound bag. It's a small site and the inclusion of parking has resulted in an obstruction to the right of way that other parties have a legal right to use and enjoy. Finally, just point out that the design defects were came about by the applicant selection, not by constraints on their own site. So just want you to keep those in mind when we go through the staff report. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Um, are there others who are not the applicant or DRB members who wish to provide testimony at this time? Are we able to at um, a later time? Yeah. Can we, you know, as the um, conversation continues or not? I, um, go ahead, Meredith. I was just going to say that, I mean, Alicia is with the whole group with, with Pat and Phil. Um, I think it might make sense to move on, you know, move through the staff report at this point and just check with Alicia when she has questions, if that works with you, Kate. Um, I'm sorry, when you say check with Alicia when she has questions, let, you mean invite her to chime in? Yeah, invite her. When we get through a section, we can then invite Alicia or Phil or Pat to, to chime in. Sorry, Alicia, I forgot you don't have video. That's okay. Thank you. I, I, um, think, I just, think that just, will work. Just as a clarification, oh, Kevin, I, think, I think we should uh, be able to take general comments as we work our way through the, uh, through the, through the staff uh, report and observations. Um, I mean, we, we control the dialogue uh, tenor and, and, and so there's not a risk there. It's, I think it's better for the public discourse. Okay, I think that's a good suggestion and I think it'll keep us organized. Um, but I appreciate the general overviews and the airing of general concerns that we've heard as well. Um, and so at this point, I would like to turn to the staff report. I would also like to acknowledge that many of us have been on the Zoom call for two and a half hours. So could I propose an eight minute break and bring us back at 930? Would that be agreeable or would folks like to um, soldier on? A great idea. Um, please, since I've been on a call actually since 530, since I started at <laughs> NRC. I think that's it. We'll do it for Meredith. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you learned it. All right. See you at 930. Yes. Oh, this thumbs up. I love it. <laughs> Three thumbs up. Um, all right. Well, thank you again, everybody, for sharing with us. We're using a new technology, and we're dealing with um, projects that we want to review thoroughly. And so the investment of time, I think, is ultimately worthwhile. So again, my appreciation for that. Um, all right, without further ado, I'd like to dive into the staff report. Um, here we go. Everybody has a copy of it. I'll refer to page numbers as I go. Um, starting on page five of the report um, is a discussion of the overlay district, which is where the design control considerations come in. And um, the suggested finding from staff is that um, with the recommendations from the design review committee, this project does meet that portion of the zoning bylaw, but, um, and the recommendations are to dye the concrete to match the granite on the facade. Then there were also the additional but optional suggestions <laughs> of additional um, ornamentation, I'm sure that's not the right word, um, around the Eastern entrance. Um, and so I want to see if DRB Members have any questions about that? Okay, and do I gather from earlier testimony that the applicant is um, amenable to the required change from the DRC and open to the additional change, the additional suggestions from the DRC? Yes, we are. Okay, very good. Um, is there anything else on that? on that topic that folks would like to ask or address. And I would include um, the, the abutters in that as well. No. No, oh, thank you. Um, okay. Kate, just as a yes. procedural matter, just wanted to clarify for everybody that 
what would happen, assuming this all gets approved, is that the tinting of the granite would be a condition of the permit. Um, the other optional items would just be as part of, you know, on the record in the decision as options. They wouldn't be listed as specific conditions of the permit. That's a good clarification. Thank you. And we'll we'll tint the concrete. We'll we won't tint the granite. Unless, <laughs> Correct. Unless being yeah, from Barry, sorry. you know how to do that. <laughs> sorry, yes. Tint the concrete to match the granite. Excellent, excellent. I'm no engineer, but all right, great. Um, thanks. We, we will continue through the um, the staff report. Thank you for that clarification. Um, so we know that the uses here are allowed uses. Um, we also know that the condition that the drive through being proposed is a conditional use that we'll review further against the conditional use standards mm -hmm. in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Oh, was there a question? Nope, I think that was Phil getting out of his chair. Okay, that's a lot. Um, the dimensional standards for this site are met as laid out on page six of the staff report. Those include density, height, setback, et cetera. Um, the accessory structures and uses um, is, is the drive-through and that we're going to address under conditional use. There's no demolition, riparian areas, wetlands or vernal pools, or steep slopes. Um, regarding erosion control, um, another one of our general standards, we just want to confirm from the applicant that um, there will indeed be in, um, compliance with our erosion control practices during construction activities. And if that were to be included as a condition, kind of a standard condition, that would be acceptable. That is. Yeah, and I just want to point yeah. out the erosion control front very quickly that um, given the nature of this site, the large majority of the excavations are going to be what are, what are generally termed in the erosion control world contained excavations. In other words, they have no outlet. Um, and so that would be the building foundation, utilities, and so forth. There's no sort of mass earthwork on the site because of the small nature and urban nature of the site. So pretty much anything that's not a contained excavation is going to be covered with gravel. Um, and compacted gravel, the state considers from an erosion control perspective to be stable. So basically you're gonna have stable areas and contained excavation. So you're not gonna see probably the traditional erosion controls um, that you would see on a larger site with more earth disturbance, but certainly um, meeting the city and state standards for erosion control. Good, thanks for that description that way. If there aren't hay bales on it, people won't be surprised. Is that, is that what you're telling us? Right, unlikely the site will be surrounded by silt fence because then you couldn't get to it. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, our next section of the staff memo, and here we're on page eight, is regarding stormwater management. And no concerns with the stormwater plan have been raised by the Department of Public Works. So staff is finding that this um, complies with the requirements. Um, do any DRB members or others have questions about the stormwater management aspects of this. Kevin, I see that you're talking, but I don't hear you. Oh, we're still missing you, Kevin. I'm not, it might, you might've done a double click there. That's all right, I can. Okay, go ahead. What's that? Yes. Okay, I, I was just affirming what, what you said about, about the TRC and DPW. Uh, th th that seems to be not a, a pressure point on this application. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, Section 310 access and circulation is much of what we have been discussing. So um, we've, we've heard from the applicant and the abutters, so I'm particularly interested in, in DRB member discussion on, on the various issues here. Um, sure, we can we can dive right in. Rob, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to follow up here. If there's any, I think there's some documents maybe represented in the, uh, we got some deeds regarding the access. Um, I don't know if there's any other that want to be added to the public record from any of the interested parties that are commenting. Um, I, I know we just have one um, deed and some analysis from uh, 
that's in the record and it seems like something else was being discussed uh, from the adjoining property owner. Uh, Rob, I, I, not to speak for the adjoining property owner, but I don't know that anyone's uh, disputing the rights that folks have to go up and down the right of way, just a matter of whether um, the parking uh, layout uh, creates traffic conflicts or not. Okay. Phil, did you want to add something? No, I, I mean, I can provide the, the DRB with a copy of the 1925 deed, which I believe is the source of the right of way. Um, I'd be happy to submit that tomorrow or the next day. Yeah, Phil, this is Meredith. <laughs> if you email it to me so because it was mentioned so that it is part of the sure. record, I would appreciate it. Yes, I will do so. Great. Good. And I see another raised hand and it appears to be Sarah. Hi, I just, um, since we're on the topic of the access, I did want to. Um, oh, sorry, you Sarah, would, would you tell us, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Sarah, I can hear you. Would you, would you tell us, um, I haven't been introduced to you yet, so would you just okay. mind saying um, who, who you're with or what your interest is? I, I'm Sarah Field. I'm an attorney for the applicant, and um, I'm just here to listen in and to speak to the right-of-way issue because I did all the title work for the applicant when they purchased the property. And I'm familiar with the site and the history of the site from the title perspective. And I'm also familiar with the use of the site historically. So um, I, I, I agree with Phil, there is no dispute that that is a shared right of way. The deeds are clear. There's a 20, there's a, there was a base deed of all three properties. The first parcel was out to, to Phil's client's parcel. And then the next two pieces came out um, fairly quickly thereafter. So this right of way has been used by these three property owners for nine, for 95 years yes. with, without dispute. So um, I think that's beyond dispute. I, I would just like to, um, to, to speak to the issues that Phil raised briefly um, and point out that the use of the space to put these three spaces there is no different than the gas station used. The pictures that the historical pictures that were showed showed the gas station with cars parked there. So that's been a historic consistent use of that space. Um, the 99 State Street property uses, would also have to back into the right of way to turn their cars around to get out that space. They come in from both sides and they angle their cars so that when you're coming in for the 10 and a half foot to get out, you, you have to back out into the right of way to turn around. So everyone has to use that space the same way. Um, and that's just the nature of that space. It's a fairly short sight distance. It's, you're not likely to go barreling in and not see what's at the other end. So um, it's, it's been used for almost a hundred years that way. And people seem to have been able to work it out. And I don't, I don't think that the proposed use of this space is any different than it's been going on for, you know, hundred years. Um, and, and, and also I would add that if, if you were to find that Phil's, suggestion is compelling and say that, okay, you can't have parking, you would be essentially denying um, the, the 105 State Street properties deeded rights. You, you would effectively be shutting them out from having any access to that space at all. They can't use it the way they always have. So that's, as we go through this, I think what I just wanted to add to that analysis, um, make sure that everyone's clear that this is really not a change of use at all. It's the same use that's always existed. They just happened to put a couple stripes on the on the area um, that the gas station didn't have on the ground. It's exactly the same way the gas stations used it. And, and as far as 95 years, um, the building owner on 99 State Street has used this space and shared it for 23 years. So there, you know, in, ter in terms of objecting to the use of this space, the, the clock is kind of run. That's all I have to say about the shared use of that right of way. Okay, thank you for thank you very much, um, Joe. You had your hand up. If you want to unmute and talk. Yeah, um, about the former usage of the parking area, uh, the image that we were shown, I, I would disagree that it shows a similar circumstance because it it the conflict point in that uh, picture that we were, saw of the old gas station is well back from the, from the right of way. Well, not the easement, but the you know, state right of way. Um, by moving all that parking up along the side of the building there, now the conflict point is right at the entrance. And that would mean that a car that's 
coming in would be stopped within the travel way or on the sidewalk. Whereas before they were in the interior of the lot and they weren't interfering with the roadway. So I'm not sure that it's a completely apples to apples comparison. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'll say Jean and then RJ. Um, yeah, I agree with Joe. And uh, I, I just want to make a comment. I mean, it's a wonderful, beautiful design that fits the, the cityscape. And, and this is a long time coming. And I think, you know, the city's going to be excited about a new structure there with the, the wonderful landscape design as well. Um, and, and I do all the questions and concerns that Phil brought up, I, I also have, and Joe made a good co a point right now that the use is different than it was, it hasn't been the same usage for 100 years, considering that now it's not a gas station, um, it's going to be a bank with an ATM drive through next to uh, 99 State Street that also has an ATM drive through So my concern is, I think a lot of us, our concern is gonna be the traffic problem, not the dispute of the right of way necessarily. Okay, thanks, Gene. RJ? Um, the, it looked like in that picture and, and for that, from what I remember of that gas station that cars were able to park sort of facing front out as opposed to parking in against the building. Um, so I feel like that would also change use based on the way that space used to flow. Um, you know, cause you're, you're suddenly having people back out, which is kind of more dangerous than um, people, you know, obviously facing forward and, and looking where they're going. Um, uh, yeah, where that, um, you know, it was when, when Brian was, was talking, he was saying like that, you know, it's the back, the, the cars are going to kind of be where the, the front of those cars are now, but I feel like you're talking about something different with the front of a car and the back of a car and the way people are driving in a tight spot. In Thanks, that awesome. picture, they're actually in both directions. The car to the rear has to back out. This vehicle, the truck, can pull out. The car to the rear has to back out. And can I make a quick response on that as well? Yeah, please. Uh, so the cars that are backed in against the building have to make that very movement that uh, Phil was concerned about in terms of blocking the 99 uh, State Street use of the right of way. So in order for this truck to be backed in against the building, they had to drive in the right of way and then back the truck up against the building. Um, so that movement of going down the right of way, backing into somewhere and coming back out down the right of way again is, is was the historical way that that right of way was used when the gas station was there. Um, so regardless of whether someone parks notes in against the building, and then backs out to use the right of way or parks backed in against the building, they're still making that same three point turn um, to get in and out. Of well, that. one point though is, is that they are stopping in between. So they're pulling in and parking, and then they're in theory not in the right of way for a period of time, and then they're getting back in and pulling out instead of backing out of the parking space, pulling forward, backing into the drive through, and then pulling in again. So the time that they're actually in the right of way maneuvering continuously or all in one piece is not broken into two separate um, maneuvers. Understood, but um, anyone anyone who's backing their back here, so the visibility here is really good. I went down there myself and parked my car in the accessible park, as close as I could get to where that accessible parking space is. Um, and you can see a long way down the right of way, you can see backwards across the front line of, line of AIV to folks coming down the street. Um, and anyone who does have to make the double maneuver 
um, when they back into the uh, beginning, the mouth of the uh, drive through uh, then has the opportunity to allow anyone coming down from AIB to pass through. So there's still opportunity for people to pass by without necessarily having to wait for that entire um, movement to, to cycle. And, you know, we're presenting that as, because we were asked the question of, is there a way for people to exit the site without going on to other folks' property? Um, to be totally honest, and, and is similar to other properties in downtown, uh, what people are probably most likely to do is to pull into the front of the thrush parking lot to turn around and leave. Um, now, do we have the legal right to do that? No. Um, is it likely that someone's gonna be standing out there preventing that from happening? Also, no. Um, so, you know, we feel that there's no, um, you know, no more uh, impingement on the right of way with our design than there has been uh, historically. The other thing I wanted to address was the issue of um, the parking spaces, um, you know, making a situation where folks coming into the right of way from State Street are, are prevented and having to stop on the street. Um, of someone backing out from the space, preventing someone getting in from State Street is no different than someone coming out of the thrush or coming around 99 State Street and then stopping at the throat of this right of way and blocking anyone from going into State Street. So that we're not, uh, we're not adding anything more to the fact that people have to wait on the street to get in and out of this um, alleyway. Um, and I just wanted to quickly present um, one more illustration uh, in terms of this sort of access and uh, downtown Montpelier in general. Um, so we just did a quick exhibit here just to illustrate that this is uh, a fairly common situation all around downtown where you have these um, one, way, uh, one way width aisles, way access uh, in and out of parking areas. So, um, you know, just on this particular uh, exhibit, we've, we had illustrated eight other locations in the UC1 district where that um, is a common situation. And I'm sure everyone's aware of these, but I just kind of wanted to bring this up just to bring to mind that people are used to this situation in downtown. No. And we'll head down to the end of an alleyway and see if anyone else is coming. You know, some of these are a lot more dangerous for pedestrians, particularly these ones where you have to pull right up to the end and nose your car out onto the sidewalk before you can even see. Uh, if anyone's walking down the sidewalk. So um, just wanted to have shown that to everyone. And we looked at that as, as well because we were thinking, oh, how do other areas deal with this? And we just, one thing we noticed is that the majority of those are bounded by buildings, not from, from maneuvering um, vehicles. So you see a car, you wait kind of on a street. Um, it, it just doesn't have somebody starting to back out from a parking space as you're already pulling in or um, pulling out. Go ahead, Tom. Sorry. I'm going to... Oh, no, not at all. Yeah. And so the, the one with the post office courthouse, it looks like. Um, it seems Brian, like could you bring way. that picture back up, please? Brian, the uh, original Google picture. Because it'll give. No, the uh, one before that, <laughs> the Google one. <laughs> Sorry. He wants the Harold's goal. So these, uh, just for, because it didn't really show well uh, when Mr. Zellinger was trying to explain, you know, the traffic flow. This is the right of way. Uh, you see the right of way. It's, you know, the 10 and a half feet. It actually extends out beyond uh, 107. Uh, what I'm with you, Phil, the Thrush Tavern. Sorry. <laughs> I right. can't, I can't not get used to it myself. But as you can see, the uh, spaces, if you go to the far rear of the lot at 99, those spaces also have to back into the right of way. And that is a 180 degree uh, turn. It makes a 180 degree turn when you come in on Mr. Bashara's right of way, thank you, and go around the building. Uh, you know, you're backing out of the 99 State Street spaces and you're backing into the right of way. They actually uh, you know, my only concern is I don't want to create a double standard here. They aren't. So, There's already an additional 10 feet behind those parking spaces. So that uh, aisle no, width is they, 20 they, feet wide there. No, ma'am. The right of way oh, extends the to line. within eight feet of the property line in the back there. So if you're using the, the frontmost spaces, there's no way to back out other than to back into the right of way. Right. I'm going to interject here for just a second. This is Kate. 
um, and um, oh, I appreciate this com conversation. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit hard to compare apples to apples when we don't have a site plan of the of the 107 and the 199 or and the 99 property. So this is some this is some good data from people's um, experience. I, I think I also want to point out that part of our standard is making sure that this is appropriate for the context of downtown. And so comparing it to existing uses is appropriate, but the other thing we need to do is compare it to the standards that we have to follow. So yes. we are um, considering both of those things in our in our discussion. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, Rob. Yeah, um, I just uh, wonder if we could run through on the site plan the choice for diagonal parking versus perpendicular um, and that des those design decisions. Um, I, I think that would be, I think that would be fine. I also think we are, um, it's, it's, it's our job to review, um, it's our job to review what's proposed and um, be cautious about redesigning the project. Um, but if, if I, but we could take some brief testimony on the decision to do the angled parking versus the nose in parking. And maybe while that image is coming up, I can have Joe speak, um, ask his question. Well, I, I just want to add to that just why, um, given the conflicts that the parking creates and the fact that it's not necessary, I would like uh, the applicant to plead their case for the parking spots. Um, okay, so maybe we can, Jay, maybe we can do the, both of those um, things at once. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I can go back to the original siting of the building. Um, Jay, do you have, I asked you to do a rendition. Um, we had, it was a discussion we had uh, and what that area would look like if I put the parking on Governor Davis Drive. In other words, if I push the building, do you have that rendition somewhere, Jay? Oh, uh, it's not really coming up, all of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure why we're not seeing the whole thing here. Let me see what I could do. Yeah. There we go. Okay, great. Um, so early on, and, and I apologize, I know it's late, but we spent a lot of time with this. So early on when we talked about uh, that exact building, I, I always liked the building design. I never wanted to change that, but we talked about how to site the building. And originally at one point, we actually talked about flipping the parking and putting the parking on Governor uh, Davis Drive. So you would pull in on Governor Davis Drive and you'd pull immediately into the parking space now, you know, the problem with a site like this is you got to try to make everybody happy. It's a bit of a beauty contest. So I was aware that my neighbor to the rear and many others in Montpelier were sensitive to the sight line of the Thrush Tavern. We're going to start calling it the Zallinger Tavern. <laughs> yeah, the, the Thrush Tavern. And I knew that people were, were sensitive to that. So... So when we originally, the better design, the de design I actually liked better was putting the parking on Governor Davis Drive. And that would have made the traffic flow, uh, you actually would have entered the drive through on Governor Davis Drive. And then you would have actually taken a right coming out of the drive through and you would have blended with the traffic on uh, coming out of 99th Street. Um, or toggle so, out. That's the, you could have accessed the ATM machine from the passenger side. Oh, no, you, put it, you, ju you just put it on the driver's side. I mean, they're remote ATMs anyway. You're okay. not, there's no person behind there. It's just, you know, max headroom. So, uh, oh, wow. so we would have, so that was the way we, we originally thought about it. Um, not only would that have made, it would have hidden, you can see in the right-hand drawing, that's, that's what you would have seen. So as proposed, that you see the thrush, you see the main doorway, you see it from the sidewalk level, you know where you're going. John's building remains very visible. If we do the parking on Governor Davis, the gray square on the right-hand side, you can see that John's building disappears. Um, more importantly, um, over the years, I've had discussions with the state of Vermont and with Vermont Mutual and with the city of Montpelier about the development of what 
people affectionately call the Montpelier the pit. Um, if we push the building, if we flip the parking and push the building all the way to the right of way, which it, the, if there is zero setback, um, then basically what we would do is we would preclude any development that occurred in the pit from exiting onto State Street. So by putting the building the way we did, if you look at that space, if someone came along and said, we want to develop the pit and we want to be able to exit on State Street, it would be very easy to approach 105 State Street about that. We would give up our parking spaces. We'd give up our sidewalk. We'd obviously want our parking spaces, uh, you know, replace the three spaces. But what this configuration versus the configuration on the right does for you is you would actually, if you put a sidewalk along, you'd actually have two lanes of traffic, 12 feet in each lane. Obviously, it would require the joint, you know, the property owners would have to uh, cooperate with each other and with any potential developer. But we wouldn't, but by placing the building the way we've done it, we haven't precluded two lanes of travel and a six foot sidewalk going back to the pit. So for us, you know, as we looked at the options, you know, urban planning requires a bit of vision and, and, and looking at not only what's good for me, yeah, I could push the building all the way over to the right and, and blend the traffic, blend my uh, counterclockwise traffic with the 99 State Street counterclockwise traffic and the world would be wonderful. But I would totally foreclose any opportunity for anyone developing the pit to have two lanes of access and a six foot sidewalk going back there. So that's the, you know, that's the, the thought process that went into this design. And, and honestly, as I looked at it, um, you know, there have been three cars, I, I could have eliminated handicapped uh, parking. There's no requirement for me to have any parking. Having a friend who is sitting permanently, I, I've always paid attention to that uh, with every building that we've ever designed. So, um, you know, the, that's the thought process that went into it. I, I don't see us, I truly don't see us adding to traffic congestion. We're they parked three cars at the gas station, and, and sir, your argument, you know, your, your your point is is well taken, but there have been three cars parking on the side of the gas station for for 50 years. Uh, so I don't see that this design, as proposed, uh, adds to the congestion. And that's you know, that's just the history of how how what the thought process that went into citing the building the way we did. Thank you. I, I have a question um, that follows on to what you've just said, Tom. It, we're comparing this to the use of the, the use of space structurally, if you will, that there have been cars parked next to the right of way for decades. So we know that cars can fit there and they can get in and out. I'm thinking in terms of the actual function on a day to day basis as, as parking spaces, cars will be coming and going much more frequently then I assume cars arriving at the beginning of the day for repair and leaving two days later would be. So I'm picturing a more dynamic site than there has been in the past, which creates more intensity of use, or asks more of that right of way. Yeah, um, it, am I wrong about that? Well, is, is, I, that, I, is that an accurate it, description? So well, I, I'm sorry, who is? It's, it's Brian. Is that my question, I'm sorry. Because uh, I would I would beg to say no, uh, because again, if you look at the historical photo, you had gas pumps there. Now, gas pumps, you know, in terms of vehicle generation, gas. So the vehicles they were either they had to get to those gas pumps somehow. Uh, so they either entered or exited through the right of way. Cars can only move. You know, I, I don't. They could have backed up, I suppose, but. Uh, you know, and they were gas pumps that serviced vehicles on both sides of the pump. So our our proposed, you know, the proposed traffic that we're generating, I think is significantly less than 
two-phase gas pumps. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to make sure we don't get too far. Um, Joe, was your question about the choice to include parking at all, was that answered by the overview just now? I, I suppose, um, just to clarify, you said that you'd be willing to eliminate your parking though, if you could get it in the, the pit area as part of some future development as yet not created. Yeah, I put it, you know, listen, I spent, well, we, my public services are relevant, but I believe in being visionary when you, when you develop uh, in a downtown. And as I looked at that area and we looked at siting the building, putting the parking on Governor Davis, the fact that I would, you know, my option was I could keep that, um, those travel lanes 24 feet. So if anyone ever did develop the pit, they could approach me. Obviously, they'd have to approach the owner of 99 State, whether Mr. Malone, in fact, closes or not. It, they'd have to approach all of the owners of those properties. And obviously, we'd all have to cooperate. In terms of, you know, I, I believe your question is, would I put in writing and guarantee that I would give up those parking spaces if they were replaced to facilitate a development in the pit? The answer is absolutely yes. Okay, thank you. I just and did we get an answer? Um, oh, sorry. Oh, just uh, if you don't, uh, sure. if you wouldn't mind waiting for just a second, Alicia. Um, I want to make sure. Um, Rob, was your question answered about why diagonal versus perpendicular parking? For now, yes. <laughs> for now, okay. Um, uh, I'll um, put it over to you, Alicia, and I'll keep my eyes out for others who are able to raise their hands as well. So, Alicia, please. Um, I just wanted to mention that the gas station also had two curb cuts that could go in and out, um, one off of State Street and this common right-of-way, and then one off of Governor Davis allowed an in and an out on both of those. So that's um, also rather different as far as traffic circulation. Um, so much, Cars only again. move in one direction, ma'am. <laughs> they, they've either yeah. got to enter on state or leave on state. I agree. This is Jay. Can you hear okay. me now? Yeah, go ahead, Jay. And if folks okay. didn't mind just raising their hand, that'll give me my visual. Yeah, I, I didn't realize I was great. muted. Um, to answer the question of why the diagonal, when we were looking at how to obtain the parking, I had sat with Tom McCardle several times and we looked at in the diagonal with it with the perpendicular, the car takes up more space. So we would lead further out toward the right of way. Whereas with the, the angular parking, and this is a 30 degree angle, it lessened the amount of space needed from the building. So that was the Great. reasoning for that. Great, thank you. Appreciate the geometry. That's a, that's a very good reminder. Um, other comments from, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll go to Brian in a sec. Before I do, um, BRB members, other um, things you want to jump in on this? Okay, Brian, please go ahead. So just two more small points on, on access and circulation and, and why parking. Um, to, to, to address the why do we need parking question at the site, I think everyone is aware of the challenges of parking in downtown Montpelier, particularly when the uh, legislature is in session and also aware of the significant efforts that the city is going through right now against some headwinds to create um, create parking in downtown. So, um, you know, in order to make uh, an, an economically viable project in the long term uh, for that will improve downtown Montpelier, um, we're looking to get some parking at this facility in order to, um, you know, if nothing else, ease some of the existing parking issues in downtown. Um, and then uh, regarding, I just wanted to circle back really quickly to, to conflicts between, um, folks using the right of way and people driving on State Street. I just wanted to um, really specifically point out um, Tom McCardle from the Montpelier DPW. Um, you know, we had some long conversations in the TRC hearing uh, about the safety of, and of that access with regards to the sidewalk and with regards to State Street. Um, and so um, following TRC, Tom provided this comment about uh, access on the State Street. He said, I believe there will be occasional conflicts between ingress and egress movements within the common driveway. To the extent these conflicts affect the sidewalk, pedestrians, and through traffic on State Street is unknown, 
but will likely have minimum safety and inconvenience impacts due to low speed and good visibility. So just wanted to point out that the city's own staff have, have looked at the potential for conflicts with traffic on State, State Street and um, find them to be minimal. On State Street, and not necessarily the, on the, um, not necessarily on the actual site circulation, internal with the three different properties using the common right of way. Yeah, my intention was to address the comments about conflicts with cars on in the public right of way. Understood. Right. So that's that's a good reminder that when the DRB deliberates, we'll be considering um, circulation within the site as well as safe access onto and off of the site. Those are kind of two pieces of it. Um, I think we've gotten some really good uh, testimony on this, and I'm inclined to move on. Um, I'm sure we'll circle back to it in certain ways. Um, so we have discussed, um, I'm, I'm back to the staff report here on page nine. We've talked about the fact that the, oh, Phil, before I go on, do you have something? You're muted. You're muted, Phil. Try now. Nope, still muted. I didn't say anything. Now I'm unmuted. Oh, okay, right. Phil. I, I, yeah. so I just, I just want to put some context for the DRB. Um, were, if the applicant were renovating Harold's Gulf and, and changing the existing use to a 21st century use, the historical operations there might be relevant, but Harold's Gulf was demolished two years ago. The, the site is lying fallow, lay fallow for several years. And so the historical use isn't really germane to what the DRB has to assess now. The DRB is, is charged with assessing whether the project is going to be, is designed to prevent traffic conflicts within the site. So Harold's Thank Gulf you. is gone and forgotten. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on. Um, so we've discussed the, the right of way and how that right of way will function given the proposed use and it's our duty to make sure as a DRB that that is, um, that meets our, our standard here for vehicular access. Um, Sorry, I'm sort of skimming as I go here. Um, don't worry, I also read it before. Um, we've talked about curb cuts. We've talked about shared um, shared access is already in place. Spacing of access points is suitable. Um, I'm sorry, let me back up a little bit. When we talked about the right of way width, um, we we need to determine as a board whether it's appropriate for two-way traffic in a commercial lot to be 11 and a half or so, 11.71 feet rather than the standard of 24. We've heard testimony on that. Um, we've also heard testimony on backing out of the accessible spot. We need to determine that that is, is going to be safe. Um, continuing through the staff report, page 10. <laughs> Um, I'm looking mostly at the red. So at the bottom of page 10 is where we talked about, um, or where the staff report highlights, highlights potential issues with queuing in the two waiting spots behind the drive-through. And um, we have talked not specifically about the queuing, but we have talked about how, what the expectations are for how that space would be used either as an exit from the site when there aren't any cars in the drive through or a turnaround spot for cars coming out of the parking area. Um, we, we need to make a determination that there is sufficient driveway length to prevent queuing in the street. Um, And we need to make sure there's not internal conflict on in the site. I think we have received adequate testimony to allow us to contemplate that. Do DRB members feel that they have enough information? Okay, great. 
Um, just looking at my notes here, please bear with me. Okay. Um, we've discussed exiting parking spaces. Emergency vehicle access is, is not raised as a concern here in the staff report, bottom of page 11. Um, moving on to page 12, street improvements are not necessitated given the expected volume of traffic. It's fairly low. Um, so then in our deliberations, as the staff report indicates on page 13, page 12, we're going to be talking through the things that we've just received testimony on. I think that's where I need to leave it for now because we're going to need to probably deliberate as a board. So I'm going to move on. Um, Meredith, jump in here if there's anything procedurally that you want me to pause and um, tend to. Will do, nothing yet. Um, all right, cool, thank you. Um, the proposed parking spaces that are there meet the dimensional requirements. Um, though the issue is with the shared right of way and whether, whether we want to, that 20 foot uh, corridor, if you will, between that is typically required for parking. We heard testimony from Brian that for angled parking, that is not as necessary because of the turning radii. Um, okay, so we have thoroughly discussed, I think, access and circulation. And what I want to do now is move on to the special use standards, which apply to the special use on this property, which is the drive through. Okay. Is everybody with me? Yes. You're very good sports. So the special use standards um, are laid out on page 14 of the staff report. And um, list a number of, of requirements that the stacking lanes be located to the side or rear of the building. They are. The stacking lane shall be clearly signed, marked, et cetera. Um, and separated from travel lanes and shall not block access to parking, loading, and service areas. It seems not to be the case. Um, however, based on testimony we've heard, you know, this, this special use standard says the stacking lanes shall be separated from travel lanes. At the same time, we have heard that the, the drive-through area may at times be used as a travel lane to exit the site. Is, my, is that correct, what I just said, that at times it may be used to exit the site? Uh, it's not, a, people may go out that way if there's no one in the drive-through. Um, it's, you know, because it's still only a one-way access, there won't be any conflict with folks using the, the uh, drive-through tellers. Okay. Meredith, does the standard that stacking lanes be separated from travel lanes preclude the use of a drive-through as a travel lane? Or am I reading into that? I, I have no further clarification other than what it says. Okay. Um, I'll take it at face value then. This is, this is not something that has been interpreted previously. Um, I think this mostly has to do with making sure that the end of a car in a stack lane doesn't um, stick out into a travel lane. Okay, um, the pedestrian crossing is not relevant because of the location of the stacking lane. Um, it is not within the required setback because there isn't one. The size is appropriate. Um, there is a roof overhang as, as described and pointed out in the design. And I'm at the bottom of page 14 now. Um, Standard G on our list is that drive-through facilities and drive-in establishments shall be located a sufficient distance from property lines and screened to prevent adverse impacts, including but not limited to noise and light trespass on adjacent properties. So we've heard testimony about noise and light, which um, both sound quite minimal, um, and how services will be provided. We need to discuss whether the drive-through is located a sufficient distance from property lines and screens to and to pre prevent adverse impacts. Um, 
So I'll start with the one that I think is a little easier. DRB members, um, do you feel that you've received testimony that um, there is sufficient screening or buttress uh, avoidance of the noise and light trespass from the functions of the drive through do, do folks have thoughts on that in the DRB? No. Is it for noise and light? Correct. Yes. You feel it's okay. All right. Thank you. So then the next question is um, whether the, you know, our standard call asks us to determine whether there is quote unquote sufficient access or distance from the property line. And we've heard testimony and seen diagrams that the drive through goes right up to the rear property line. Is that sufficient? Um, I'd invite DRB members to think about what that means and what they think. Uh, at, at this at this uh, late hour, I think what the the best thing we can do is gather the information that we can garner from uh, the open meeting, and mm -hmm. when we when we close that meeting, we can do so uh, with prejudice, which allows us to reopen it if there are sections that do not, uh, from a technical perspective, uh, meet our needs for information. Okay. Thank so, you, Kevin. I, I think mean, that is excellent It's after 10 o'clock. We should be yeah. aware of the fact that at this point, we're just gathering whatever's left out there. Okay. I'll, I'll proceed with that um, With that in mind. Thank you. And I do appreciate you all. It, it did in, in addition to this being our first Zoom meeting, this is where I get to play my, this is my second meeting of chair card, right? <laughs> so thank you all again. Um, all right, moving on through, we heard um, bottom of page 16, we've gathered the information that I think we need to determine whether landscaping requirements are met. Thank you, Bob, for that. Um, do DRB members have any further questions about landscaping? Okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, DRB will also need to contemplate um, whether screening is necessary in front of the parking area. And I think that's something that we can do using the information that we have. Um, regarding outdoor lighting, the board needs to determine whether we need additional, there, there is a requirement that a lighting plan be submitted. Um, and we need to determine whether to ask for that or whether we feel that the information we have is sufficient given the type of lighting on this site and the scale of the site and the location of the site. I wonder what DRB members' thoughts are about the need for a schematic on the lighting. I, I, would, I don't need, I don't know that I need an engineered schematic, but I'm interested in a sketch that highlights the lighting a little bit and sort of shows what, what lumens will be where. Um, would others find that valuable? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Would the applicant be willing to provide that? Yes, we can do that. And I, I my understanding, however, was that there was, if you were below uh, 2000 lumens, you didn't need to provide that. All of ours are below that amount. Um, no, Jay, for all major site plans, there's supposed to be a lighting plan. Period. Um, okay. I thought there was an exemption. Uh, nope. So if you look in um, section 3204C, it's just one sentence. All applications for major site plan approval shall include a lighting plan prepared by a qualified professional lighting designer or engineer. Period. Um, so, you know, we had discuss this and the fact that you didn't have a lighting plan and I was like well you're not proposing any you know new standalone site lighting and I wasn't quite sure without that if the DRB was going to require the full site plan full lighting plan um but they are so although I think I heard it might not need to be an engineered plan um, we can show the photometrics of each fixture at each location That's what I would find valuable. Is that appropriate, Meredith? Yeah, I think that's appropriate. Um, yes, we can provide that. Okay. Thank you very much. 
All right, so last, I'm going to confirm that we have the information we need to deliberate on the conditional use standards, which are what we use to evaluate the suitability of the drive through um, So we haven't talked about the capacity of community facilities and utilities, but the drive through is not going to lead to more park usage or more children in schools or more flushed toilets. So I think we're okay there. Um, we've talked in detail about traffic. Um, Regarding the drive-through, do DRB members feel they need additional information to evaluate that? I think that as we deliberate, we may, we may decide that we need more information. Okay. I think that is, that is a possibility. Um, I'm continuing through. I'm on page 22 of our staff report. Um, and I do not see any further issues on which we need to collect additional testimony. Um, are, are there any, what I'm going to do is invite final remark, final comments from the DR, final questions from the DRB members and then any final remarks, brief final remarks from um, the applicant. So DRB members, final questions. Yeah, I've got a couple, Meredith, it's Michael. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, sure, Michael, go ahead. Hey, um, with the right of way, what's the plan for handling snow and ice removal in the right of way? As someone who works at 107, I know that, I just know that that's a problem. Historically, that's an issue. Ice builds up and snow builds up. And it seems like there's a lack of ownership to who's gonna handle that right of way as it comes to snow and ice removal. The, has that ever, has that been discussed? Uh, I'm sorry, sir, was your question, of, your question was about uh, snow uh, removal in the right of way or on 105? Snow and ice maintenance on that right of way is historically, in my opinion, my humble opinion, right? It's been poorly done. Well, we and had. I'm curious if with a new building coming in, that creates a new opportunity to create a new discussion, right? And so I'm just curious if, if that has been discussed among the three, well, the other two landowners. Well, we have we have not um, we have not discussed it with the other two uh, landowners. Um, we own several properties in Vermont that share rights of way or share. Uh, you know, common uh, ingress and egress. And uh, usually what happens is one party uh, takes responsibility for it and the other two have a responsibility to reimburse them uh, for it. You know, it's a shared right of way, the uses in common. So to, to answer your specific question, sir, no, we haven't, uh, Mr. Malone doesn't own the property yet, so I can't have that discussion with him. Uh, and I, I haven't, uh, when there was an issue with the water line servicing 107 uh, State Street a couple of years ago, I paid for it. I, I didn't ask my neighbor to. So I hope that answers right. your question. We'll, okay. Thanks, we'll be on okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Michael, did you have an, another question as well? Yeah, I'm curious what what's the thoughts on the the increased traffic at the location? Has anyone done a, a vehicle study? How many vehicles you anticipate going through that property? Because as everyone knows, with that new restaurant at 107, traffic has steadily increased over the past three years to 107. So I'm curious if has anyone looked at the increase at the proposed 105? And then the secondary question is. Has there been any thought to that intersection, which can get quite congested at the morning, afternoon, and the uh, you know the 4:30 let out time for state employees? Have those been looked at in any detail? So Michael, you're asking about the traffic impacts to public rights of way and streets. How about D? All the above? No, it has there been a. a an estimate on the, the number of vehicles that you anticipate now that you're putting in potentially right putting in the bank with a drive through that I assume that's going to increase vehicles. I don't know that it'd be like Northfield, but 
there would be certainly an increase. And then that intersection, the Gov, Davis, and, and State, that intersection is, in a, it's pretty hairy at three discrete time periods during the day. Has, has a traffic study been thought about or done? So we have not done a formal traffic study. Um, typically how these things are estimated is the Institute of Traffic Engineers publishes a document. They've gone around to uh, all kinds of different sites all over the country and, and sat there counting cars. And then they publish some statistics about what you might expect from a proposed development. Um, so we did uh, using the IT information uh, and the, so they, they do them based on various independent variables. But for this one, we selected a uh, drive-in bank with a single drive-through lane. Um, typically, the, where you evaluate that is during the um, one hour in the afternoon where traffic is the worst on adjacent streets. It's known as the PM peak hour. Um, so based on the IT information, uh, we expect the project will generate 28 trips in the PM peak hour. Um, but you have to keep in mind that the way traffic engineers think about a trip is if someone comes into the site that's a trip, and when someone leaves the site that's a trip, um, so though it, it, there are 28 trips coming and going from the site, then uh, we'd expect that to actually only be 14 cars that access the site um, during the PM peak hour, um, you know, leave, coming and going, because the distribution coming and going is just about equal for these uses that have been studied. So, um, given that so you're saying that intersection is going to be hit with an additional 14 cars at, at the peak time period? That's what we would expect based on its statistics. There's some mitigating factors that go along with that. Um, one is that the 14 cars doesn't consider what's, what are called pass-by trips. Um, so pass-by trips are um, cars that were already on the street network passing by the site and then end up stopping there. So someone who works for the state goes to the bank on their way home from work, pass-by trips. So typically in an urban situation like this, you would um, reduce the number of expected peak hour trips due to the, the fact of pass by trips. We haven't done that here in this estimate. Um, but, um, you know, so we, we, we don't feel that 14 cars in a peak hours is a significant impact at all. Um, it's, it's pretty minor in, in relation to the volume of traffic that's going by on State Street in that hour. Um, and it was reviewed by DPW and they had no issues whatsoever with traffic. They didn't ask us to do a traffic study. Um, this is yeah, there's a lot of vehicle pedestrians that go by at that time. I mean, I, 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 would, I would encourage you to maybe think about that a Thank little bit. I think our threshold for a traffic study is something like 100 or 200 additional trips a day. Um, uh, so I, nope, you know, nope. Meredith? So, so the threshold for requiring a professional traffic impact study um, for proposed development is when that proposed development is expected to generate 75 or more new trips during the a.m. or p.m. peak hours on class one roads and 50 or more new trips during an a.m. during the a.m. or p.m. peak hours on class two and three roads. So we haven't I mean, we haven't met those numbers anywhere near. Um, so there's no requirement for a fresh study. Um, and when when Department of Public Works evaluates this data, they look at the condition of the nearby the, the most recently reported condition, you know, grade of the nearby intersections. Um, and so Department of Public Works felt that these numbers were, were accurate and weren't going to require a more detailed traffic study. That doesn't mean that they didn't have issues with potential conflicts, but the actual number of vehicles was not an issue for them. Right. Okay, great. All right. Thank you, Michael. Um, any um, brief closing comments from the applicant? Uh, I might just comment uh, from Jay, a comment on your question about is there adequate, I believe it was what, separation from the drive up uh, and the neighboring property. The uh, pattern of use from the tavern has been that they parked up against the Gulf Station. And my guess is mm -hmm. they will simply do the same and there will be a curb all the way along that. So I don't, wouldn't perceive there being a conflict or being any different than the past pattern. There will be a curb separating the drive-through from the other property. Correct. Okay. Other um, closing comments? Tom, did you want to, to have some remarks? Uh, no, just wanted to say 
Thank you. I mean, um, as all of you know, uh, urban planning can be a challenge. And it's never a question of what's perfect. It's a question of what's reasonable and uh, presenting an application that checks all of the boxes. Uh, it's not a beauty contest. You're not competing with any developer next door or up the street. Uh, we're proud of the project that we've uh, submitted. We think it checks all of the boxes. We think it's uh, forward looking and, and we think it complements uh, an area that we know is very special. So thanks very much for all your time. Thank you. Phil has his hand up. I, well, a, a final comment and then I will also, okay, if you can unmute, if, if, just make sure. Yes. Oh, it's, you are. Go ahead, Phil. It, it's not a comment about the substance of the proceeding. It's more about process. Um, okay. It, I, when, earlier, Kevin said that um, it would close the hearing um, with prejudice and then suggested that if you conduct your deliberations and you need more information, you may ask for it. I think, I, I think you meant without prejudice, oh, not no. with prejudice, number so, one. But, but number two, if when, you do, when we depart tonight, you either have to adjourn the hearing mm -hmm. until a date certain, in which case you leave the record open, or you have to close the hearing and the record is closed. So I, I know Kevin, we, we've been through this before. And if you need more information while deliberations are ongoing, then you won't be able to obtain it if you close the matter. Phil, you kind of you, you, jumped, you jumped you jumped in line. I was going to actually talk about that. This is Meredith. <laughs> um, so it looked to me like um, you, like the DRB definitely wants more information on the lighting plan. Is that something that you were asking for before you could make a decision about the lighting compliance? Because if so, I don't think we can, I mean, we can't close the hearing. It would be a, as Phil said, um, adjourning to a date certain or continuing to a date certain to get that additional uh -huh. information. Um, uh -huh. You know, Mike's on, so he could always talk about if I think there is a possibility of saying, oh, we're going to reopen, but that would be a whole new notice process. Um, I, mailing notice to all of the adjoining property owners, the whole thing all over again. Yeah, uh, let me okay. let me just clarify what my earlier comments were. Uh, essentially, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with what with what Phil just said. Uh, and basically, we want to make sure that we didn't limit our ability to get the information we need to further develop our uh, our review and ultimate decision on this. So my uh, uh, my intent is the same, but I would uh, defer to uh, uh, the uh, the proper process. Okay. And I don't need the lighting plan to make a decision. It's more for the record for as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so is there, then here's the thing. Does anybody feel like they have to have more information to make a decision on any of the items discussed? If they do, then we probably should clarify for the applicant what that information is so that they can get it to you at a later date at which to after which mm -hmm. there would be a deliberation. Does anybody need more information? Um, and by the way, there was a question that I somehow missed. Uh, oh, no, never mind. Okay, so I'll put that out to the DRB members. Do we need additional information in order to complete our deliberations? I don't. I don't. Okay. I think that puts us on firm ground to close the hearing and um, enter or more likely schedule a deliberative session. Could I ask another procedural question? Would it be appropriate sure, for so. interested parties to submit proposed findings? Uh, oh. No? Um, for use in the Mike? deliberation? <laughs> um, Mike, I'd object. Yeah, straight I, up, I, I, straight I up, I would object. 
It's I don't not think, standard practice. Yeah, that, uh, just hold, hold on, guys. <laughs> I think the question is this to the, the procedural people. Um, that's not something I have seen. That's not something that is anywhere in the regulations. I think that's more of a court proceeding. Um, and I appreciate the intent um, as the person who often drafts things. Um, if somebody did that, yeah, that would be great, but I don't think we can do that, Phil. Well, it's done at all kinds of administrative bodies. And this DRB is an administrative body. Mike, you have way more history in this than I do, but it's also, I mean, I, I'm not sure you could even provide that before the deliberative session. That seems like a whole extra re-adding of evidence after the hearing has been closed. Yeah, as the non the non lawyer talking about this, that that would be my only concern is that we would be taking we would be taking that evidence after the. The, the hearing, it's, I don't know how much it would be considered evidence if it's proposed findings. Yeah, right. Findings are considered evidence, but I, I don't think it's necessary. If, yeah, I mean, if we had it before, or if it was still open, I would think, yeah, we would take it under, uh, under advisement. But I think once it's closed and they go into deliberative, I don't know if they can accept any other additional, even if the applicant had additional information, I don't think it would be appropriate for the BRB to get an extra email or an extra piece of information after this after it's closed i don't think we take any more information would be my non-legal thought i've not seen it in 40 years it would be my I, I, I would have, I would have taken it before i would have taken it before it was closed i would have said yeah it, it, the, the drb could take it under advisement um, yeah so, so phil next time present it before the hearing and then we can share <laughs> it for the public record and then we're all good I'll remember that. <laughs> all right. My We're concern. learning all the time and the creativity is flowing. Um, at, at this point, I would, I would like to bring this to a close. So um, Kevin, do you have a, a last thought here? I do. Go ahead. And that has to do with the circulation uh, issue. And if we close the meeting uh, right now, we're not going to be able to go back to the applicant and say, well, you know, there may be a tweak here or a tweak there that'll make this work better. We're gonna be limited to what we have at the moment that we close the meeting. So I, I, I asked the board to, to give that some thought. Do we wanna continue this or do we wanna close it? My vote would be to continue it. Okay. And ask I would like to for a redesign of the parking or to I try think, and I, I, Again. It's, it's just a few minutes before 11 o'clock in the evening here. I don't think that good decision making is made at that time of, of the evening for most of us. I, I think, I think there is an option to continue the hearing. There would be an option to continue the hearing and to schedule a time to go into deliberation. In other yes. words, you know you're going to be going into to deliberate this. The only thing that happens once you come back is that um, you'd have to you'd have to um, come back and, and reopen the hearing to to make your if, if you wanted something else. Yeah, as I understand it, if once we close the meeting and if we want to reopen it, it has to be warned. Yeah, so you'd have I to mean, warn it to that, a date certain. That and that's a that's a time that's a time issue. Whereas if we continue it to a date certain, we can analyze the data that we now have. Maybe at the end of that of that uh, review, we say, oh, we, guess what? We have everything. But mm -hmm. I personally am not prepared to, to, to say that. OK, so let me ask a question. Um, I, we haven't done this before that I know of, but does the DRB staff, this is a staff question, does the DRB ever plan ahead to a date certain, such as June 1st, and then schedule a deliberative session in between those and then collect additional evidence on the date certain, a, a closed deliberative session to determine what additional information is needed. And I am not proposing anything sneaky. I'm just trying to think of how, how the DRB processes this into a next step. Um, I have not done this long enough to have the background. So I'm really glad Mike is on here and Phil is on here. My mm -hmm. inclination would be to say, we continue the hearing and then 
have the deliberative yeah. session. I don't feel like having a deliberative session in between makes sense, but so you um, it's okay. I mean, Mike, Phil, have either of you heard of something like that where there's a deliberative session in between two open parts of the hearing? No. <clears throat> it's happened in Act 250. Mm, okay. I, I, and I think in my experience, I've seen it in, but it's been more, happened more often in, in situations where the boards have deliberated at the time. So I've been in committees okay. where they would go in or they would close, they would, um, they would go into deliberative session and, you know, everybody goes out in the hallway and waits and then everybody comes back in and they ask for a couple more questions so they could get a clarification on a point. And then, then they Got go into, yeah, all right, we'll make our decision now. Um, we deliberated, we asked these questions, we now have an answer. Now we're gonna vote to make the decision. But I haven't seen it in between, but it functionally, I would think it would work the same way. Again, not being a lawyer, that would be things I've seen in the past. Okay, that doesn't need to, I, I wanna make sure we don't overanalyze this at, at this point, because this is not something I definitely want or need to do, but um, sure, Sarah, jump in and then Rob. Okay, I, I would just like to say on behalf of the applicant, this is a very comprehensive and, and um, uh, detailed uh, proposal and the analysis and the questions, this has gone on for some time. I'm not sure that uh, continuing these deliberations is going to amount to anything more than a rehash and a second crack at the apple to come back and, and make different arguments. You have all the evidence that we could possibly present. I don't know what else could be presented um, in, in, in terms of, uh, I, you know, is there some specific thing that you think has not been addressed due to the time constraints that needs to be further addressed? This is the opportunity to present the evidence. This is a public hearing. This has been prepared for. Our oh. experts are here. With, you know, with... I point out it's the, that it's the vice chair of the DRB who's asking for the continuance. It's not, yeah, I mean, I don't. Well, well I, I, I guess with all due respect, oh. it doesn't matter who's asked. I, the question is why? What's the purpose? What's the legal justification for it? I think we've. Uh, we want to be sure that. I'd like well, to respond. Come, I, one more information all right, on stop, it. Stop, stop, please. Thank you. Um, we want to make sure we have the information to do this right. We also want to do it in a public and forthcoming way. Um, sometimes we will have a private deliberative session where we go through everything. We usually do that after we close the hearing. I was trying to explore whether there was some other way to make sure that we did that contemplative <laughs> exercise and then also made sure we filled in, got additional information if we needed. I'm hearing that that is cumbersome and atypical. Um, so I don't mean to suggest something strange because um, I don't want to be unfair. I'm just trying to understand what the boundaries are or what we can do appropriately. Um, so filling that out, understand the vice chair's request. I'm going to hear from Rob and then from Kevin, and then I want to make a decision about where we're headed. So Rob? Uh, well, I was going to motion to continue the hearing to the next um, regularly scheduled development reboard meeting. Um, that is my motion, and uh, be happy to discuss. But I feel like as process goes, we do start start there. Sounds fine. Second. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I second. Second from Jean. Is there further discussion by DRB members? Uh, so technically, it has to be to a date certain. So we would have to state. June 1st, I believe. Okay. Yes. Um, would you accept that amendment, Rob? Yes. And Jean, would you accept, accept yeah. that amendment? Yeah. Okay. And I think Kevin's trying to talk, but he's muted. Go ahead, Kevin. He's muted. Oh, still muted. Sorry. Give us a test, test one, two, three, please, Kevin. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, under the previous uh, zoning uh, uh, regulations, uh, we would be going through a process where you have the preliminary approval and then final approval. I'm just think that considering that we're transitioning into a completely new uh, uh, ordinance, it's it's uh, important for us not to lose perspective on uh, how this process works. And since we're all, since we're now presented with a situation where everything uh, can potentially be 
uh, discussed and decided at one meeting, uh, I think we need to exercise that power judiciously. Okay, Kevin, do I hear you agreeing that it's appropriate to leave the hearing open and continue to a date certain as has been proposed by the motion? You do. Okay, is there further discussion by DRB members? All right, hearing none, we'll call the question with a vote. The motion on the floor is to continue this hearing to a date certain, which is June 1st, 7 p.m. Um, I will call the roll. RJ? Yeah. Rob? Yes. Joe? I'm going to vote no. I think I've heard enough. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael? Yes. Uh, Kevin? Yes. Jean? Yes. And this is Kate and I am voting yes as well. So the motion carries um, six in favor, one again. Uh, and we will continue the discussion of this on June 1st at seven o'clock. Thank you all for your work because this is work. Um, on our agenda, the next item is approval of the minutes. I'm going to defer, I'd like to propose that we defer that to our next meeting, not urgent business. And we will return June 1st. Um, any other business members of the board? There was a suggestion to have a possible, because some of us are new to the board, um, of having a private preliminary session, a DRB private session, maybe as a preliminary possibility. Oh, a training session? No, no, not necessarily no. training, just a, a private DRB meeting regarding uh, of the discussions that occurred here today. I think you mean to deliberate oh, a, the a, a, yeah, a private deliberate session. Correct. Thanks, Mary. That was discussed as a possibility between here and that and there. What we what we will probably do is what we may do is convene the hearing on June 1st, um, see what additional, see if we need to collect additional information and if we don't adjourn into deliberative session at that point. Is that right, Meredith? That's a likely outcome. Yeah, so, so everybody can, can, between now and June 1st, everybody can look at their notes from tonight. They can look at the staff report. They can re look over the application materials and my understanding is we're not having an in-between deliberative session because that just gets cumbersome and messy. We'll reopen the hearing on June 1st um, and have back and forth if the applicants feel like they have some additional information that they want to bring to that June 1st hearing that they think will clarify some of the questions, they can bring that. Um, uh, and not just applicants, also you know other interested parties. And then after that part will eventually, you know, dear, when the DRB is happy, they can close the hearing on this application. Um, and then what would probably happen because there will be other applications for the June 1st hearing is that you would close the hearing, plan to go to deliberative session and wait and do that deliberative session after you've gone through the other applications that are on the agenda for that night. That's usually how we do it. We don't make everybody else who's gotten on the call for a June 1st hearing wait until after you've done the deliberative session. Okay, thanks Meredith, that's a good explanation. Um, so I would say that between now and then, there are just two things I would remind folks. Um, one, um, especially for newer members, getting in the habit of um, assuring that you do not discuss these applications or how, how that um, beyond what's already been presented in the public record. If someone says, what does the application say about the right of way? You can say the application says this, but don't opine on it. That would be ex parte communication and don't collect people's opinions on it. Um, and the other thing is in advance of our next meeting, and we all did our best tonight. Um, I think people did their homework. I appreciate that. Um, now that we have information and notes from this hearing, um, please, please be prepared so that we can be expedient uh, next time. Um, and just a quick uh, note, well, if at any point DRB members do get questions from the public, they can always send them my way as well. 
um, because I can I can discuss applications with the public about you know questions about where things are, who supplied what. I can have this with the public. You aren't supposed to. Um, so at any point you start getting questioned, give them my contact information and just send them my way if you feel like you need to. That's not a problem. That's one of the things I'm here for. Great, great resource. Thank you, Meredith. Um, I'll thank you again, and I will take a motion to adjourn. Motion. Yeah. Second. <laughs> moved by our <laughs> moved by RJ and second enthusiastic enthusiastically seconded by by Joe. I'm going to assume that um, it's unanimous. So all those in favor, raise your right hand. We are adjourned. Thank you all, all right. very, very much. Bye, folks. Thank, thanks for Thank your good you, work, Kate. Kate. You did Thank a great you job. All. Yeah, it was good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.